Good evening, folks, and welcome to the May 14th, 2018 Planning Board meeting in the town of Scarborough, Maine. I'd like to call us to order this evening. Karen, will you do, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to do the Pledge of Allegiance first. All right. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, would you like to call the roll, please? Mr. Dupree? Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oglis? Okay. Uh, we had word that Rick would be joining us a little late this evening. When he returns, please note that he would be a voting member. Uh, next, I have the approval of the minutes for the April 5th and April 23rd meetings. So moved. Got a motion to move the April 5th and April 23rd minutes. Second. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor? I'm going halves on that. I wasn't here for the April 23rd meeting. I'll abstain from that vote. All right. Item number four, actually I just want to make a quick note that uh, there's a full agenda this evening. We hope we can get through it, but there is a chance that uh, one or two of the items might not make the 10.30 p.m. cutoff deadline for new business. So just be aware of that. Uh, we'll kind of get a feel of how this goes as we uh, start the evening. But I think as a consideration to everyone that's on this agenda this evening, if we try to limit our comments on our presentations, that would probably be helpful. And that way everyone can go about their business. Thank you. Um, Number four, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, Section 6, Definitions in Section 17B, Hagus Parkway District, HP-B, Permitted Uses, Conventional and Planned Developments. And we're going to have Karen Martin from SEDCO kind of do a little introduction on this for us. Thank you. So tonight we have for you, uh, for your consideration, uh, some staff-initiated, some staff-initiated uh, text amendments to the zoning ordinance, which really address some inconsistencies in the way warehousing as a use is addressed, uh, particularly in the highest Parkway. Um, one of the things that that we have seen over time is. When we made some amendments to Highgast Parkway, we've been really trying to make sure that we are clearly distinguishing Highgast Parkway as a business zone from the industrial zone. And so one of the things that we did was try to be very careful about warehousing because we really felt like warehousing as a standalone use was not really fitting in Highgast Parkway. That's really an industrial use. Um, but one of the things that, that happened is we did add some language in the ordinance that talked about limiting um, warehousing in Highgas Parkway to 50% or less. And what we've really discovered over time as we've been trying to work with that is it's not really warehousing um, uh, that we've been talking about. We've really been talking about storage. Mm -hmm. um, warehousing as a separate use where all you're doing is um, storing items. You're not doing value added. You're not doing any production. It is storage and transportation of that, those items in and out of your facility. Well, what we found is there's a lot of uh, uses in Highgas Parkway that really do need storage. And we really thought that the 50% limitation doesn't really make as much sense. We don't have that same limitation in B3 where we talk about storage as an accessory use. And what we're really trying to do, um, the bottom line of what we're trying to do, is apply the same standards that we apply to storage from the B3 into Highgast Parkway. <laughs> so what we want, what we plan on doing is recommending the, um, there's an item 10 in the permitted use that does speak specifically to um, limiting warehousing in Highgast Parkway to 50% or less of the building. We want to take that out and not allow warehousing in Highgas Parkway at all. We do want to allow storage as an accessory use, again, treating Highgas Parkway the same way that we're treating B3. 
And so the way that we're going to go about doing that, or the way we're suggesting that we do that, is really two things. One, let's eliminate item 10 because it's really not necessary. Um, Haigas Parkway already allows for accessory uses, and storage can absolutely be an accessory use. Um, so we're just streamlining the, the um, ordinance and making it easier for the applicants to understand and easier for us to administer. Now the second piece that we wanted to do to sort of avoid this confusion for other zones um, is actually include a definition of warehousing. Um, we don't currently have a definition of warehousing, and so what you have before you um, is uh, that definition. And we also went further and did a definition of distribution because those two are often used interchangeably and, and together. Um, so again, what we're really trying to do is streamline Haigas Parkway, allowing folks who are doing um, allowable uses the same uh, courtesy, the same standards that we apply <coughs> in the um, uh, B3. So warehousing as a standalone use, still not allowed. But storage for a company that does production or value added or does some other type of use, which is the primary use, but also has storage, that's, still, that's OK. We just feel we don't need item 10 that sort of gums up the definition and gums up the, the understanding of what's really happening in that zone. So try to be in the interest <laughs> of all the other applicants that are here. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and ask if there are any questions with regard to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay, did you have anything to supplement? No, I think Karen hit, hit it on the head pretty good. So okay. I think we can leave it at that. So uh, this is a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed zoning changes. So at this time, I'd like to welcome any member of the public up here that is, wants to or has a desire to speak on this issue. Please approach the podium now. <coughs> Seeing none, I'll close the public comment section of this and see if the board has any comments that they'd like to contribute to the discussion. Bob? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if um, the storage is confined to indoor storage um, or if there will be any outdoor storage. So outdoor storage is a separately defined Good. item in our ordinance. So this Good. is really about indoor storage of materials, as Karen okay. said, made or produced or somehow uh, product added or uh, value added okay. on site. Good, because I could see a lot of unintended sure. consequences yep. with that. Outdoor storage has its own separate. Okay, and then um, my other question has <laughs> to do with by, by changing the definition to warehousing and storage, have we thought about any unintended consequences with respect to B3? So I'll just start and then Karen sure. okay. can jump in. The current language in mm -hmm. the industrial and light industrial mm -hmm. talks about warehousing and storage, so that okay. is a current language. We have, um, subsequent to submitting this to council for first reading, have given that some thought, okay. did receive similar comment at the council level, so we're actually proposing to potentially strike the word storage altogether and just call it warehousing rather than warehousing and storage, because okay. that does create yeah. a little bit of confusion. And then the definition of warehousing clearly talks about it being the storage of goods, so okay. um, we think that is streamlined. But. And again, we're taking out the word, we're taking out the, the use in Haigas Parkway that talks about warehousing. Okay, so um, in the proposed zoning ordinance that's in front of us, mm -hmm. should it actually be amended where we have the two definitions at the top of the page, so it should just say warehousing, or should it say still warehousing and storage? It, we're, we're proposing, um, it. It's a fine line, and mm -hmm. probably it would be fine to leave storage in. But I think for clarification, you know, the suggestion would be let's go ahead and take um, storage out. When we presented to uh, the council, I think there were some comments like, "What does this mean? Are you still doing, you know, warehousing in in Highgate yeah. Parkway?" We wanted to make it clear okay. that we are not doing warehousing in Highgate okay. Parkway. And the fifty percent um, threshold—that's by square footage only. Correct. Is that by interior square footage? It's the way the ordinance reads right now. It's uh, does not exceed fifty percent of the floor area of the principal use. Floor area of the principal use. So again, mm -hmm. it's we, we're sort of in two places under permitted uses, saying you can have accessory uses. We say you can have okay. accessory uses, and then this Highest Parkway has this secondary statement of warehousing as a as an mm -hmm. accessory use. Thank you. I, I like that it's staff initiated. Good job. 
Yes, Rachel. Yeah, I, I had the same sort of question. <laughs> um, and, and that is I look at the definition of warehousing and storage, no matter what we do with the mm. title there, it still says a structure of building where goods and material are stored specifically for distribution to other sites or locations. Mm -hmm. And there's not a grand distinction uh, in action between mm -hmm. distribution and warehousing. The, the, there's, you may have to ask people what your intent is, but um, I was under, I, I, I think I got the impression that the concept of of storage is the material is there, it may be being used by the business um, and transferred into some other product. In other words, it may be used into manufacturing and the purpose of storage is a, a transient sort of nature um, while the material is worked on, which is different than warehousing, but this definition says specifically for distribution to other sites or locations, which is exactly what distribution already has been defined as. Right, so, so we've done two things. One, partly because the, um, the definition uses the word distribution in it, we went ahead and continued to define distribution. So those are, those are two pieces of the same definition. And the other piece of that is, and, and it could be that it's a word um, choice, it may be instead of specifically, maybe we should have used the word exclusively. So what we're talking about is when you have a um, building or use that does nothing else except warehousing, except being a storage place for product, and then also doing distribution. And in the industrial zone, both of those uses are, are listed. And again, we just wanted to cover our bases since neither of those are actually currently in uh, the definitions list. And I look like Jay wanted to add. Yeah, I guess that was the point I just wanted to make was to be clear that the word district, when you look in the industrial district, light industrial district, under permitted uses, there's currently, you know, number whatever it is, is distribution, and then following that is warehousing and storage as a separate use. Um, so they're already identified as separate uses. What we tried to do in creating the definition, um, we sort of looked at, um, both sort of national publications for definitions as well as other local definitions. We realize that there's some duplicity in word choices here, um, where some, sometimes it's the noun and sometimes it's the verb. <laughs> but um, certainly if there's other, I think I, I get the sense of the intent. I'm not sure this wording mm -hmm. actually clears it up and clears up the distinction. Mm -hmm. I have no. I have no dispute about what you're trying to do, right. Right? Okay. but yep. you know, I go back to being an English teacher and looking at this and saying I would be great question marks mm -hmm. and a little note in red pen that says mm -hmm. um, exactly what do you mean by this. Okay. Right. So excellent point and I think we've, we've struggled with trying to make sure that we're uh, using that as well. So again, there, I think we could do some more clarification of that use, but as long as we're as long as everybody is understanding what the intent of it is, I think we can clarify um, those, mm -hmm. the definition. Well done. Yeah. I've got um, <clears throat> one follow-up, um, and I, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but when you were going through the definitions of what warehousing versus a storage is, is there an actual time frame associated mm. with it? Whereas mm -hmm. if a product is sitting on a shelf for more than a two year period, is it now considered storage? Is that maybe the finer line? Uh, have you come across any definitions that contain time frames in them? I didn't, and I, Jay did a lot of the background yeah. research on the definition, so. I, I, I did not, and you know, I, I did not find sort of the, the definition. It's really, again, sort of that principle of use being something's coming in, sitting there for whatever that duration is, nothing's really happening with it, and then it's going back out. And, it's, and I think a lot of this, um, you know, I think when we talk about distribution and warehousing in the industrial area, we're thinking a lot about truck traffic. And I think that was, and I think maybe Karen touched on this a little bit, you know, that, that's sort of the, I think was the, behind the original intent is the Heinz Parkway is really designed to be a, a jobs 
creator of a, it, you know, frankly, the original vision was quite a bit different, but it still, it's still less the intent. Um, where warehousing distribution, typically you're looking at a big metal building that has a guy or two running a forklift. You know, it's not, it's a, certainly something that's needed, um, but I think that wasn't the intent for the highest point. And I think, you know, the other thing that we're definitely relying on is the design standards are the unique feature within Highgus Parkway that helps us distinguish uses that would normally you would think, oh, that's really industrial. So we've tried to walk that fine line of there are some uses with the appropriate design standards can function perfectly well in the Highgus Parkway without turning it into an industrial park per se. Uh, so we, we continue to walk that fine line and try to make it easier for folks and for us to administer, but still keeping um, really a distinction between industrial and Highgus Parkway. Thank you. Um, so, you know, in general, I think, you know, we're dealing with a pretty straightforward concept that we can all grasp, and then we find out wordsmithing can be part of the, the devils in the details bit of Absolutely. this. Um, but also just a reminder to this board that, you know, if you put it into practice, there's always a chance to go back and fine tune it based mm -hmm. on what's being seen on the on the ground um, versus what the intent really is on this. So, um, and this is just an opportunity for us to give advice back to the council on their final work that needs to be done on this. So, uh, did you have something to add, Roger? No. 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 Um, so I would just say that in general, I think pass along that we're in favor of what we're seeing here with some some wordsmithing mm -hmm. work maybe yep. uh, ahead of us, but and all were, were relatively comfortable with the change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on here is uh, Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, as presented. This is the Crossroad Holdings LLC, LRPC, and Jay, would you like to prime us on this one? Sure, I'll just give you a, a, a brief intro. Uh, the Downs team is here, the Crossroads Holdings team, I should say, is here to uh, make a presentation. This is really their initiative. But um, as uh, some planning board members may know, uh, this item has gone before the, when they started initially thinking about some of these ch changes. Um, they had at least one, I think it was actually two conversations with the Long Range Planning Committee before putting forward formal uh, language to council and now ultimately the planning board for consideration. So um, there has been some vetting by at least the Long, long Range Planning and we're interested to hear what planning board members have to say. So. Without further ado, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ready, Dan? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Dan Bacon with Goral Palmer. And on behalf of uh, Crossroad Holdings, LLC, as uh, Mr. Chase introduced, um, <coughs> the Downs team has been busy. Uh, we've been before you a few times now with our master planning process um, as called for with the Crossroads District. And we've also been to the Long Range Planning Committee really as we shape the, shape the vision and the plan for uh, this large piece of property in the center of the community. Um, over the many months, we've been getting input from not only the planning board, but other local boards and committees, uh, SEDCO in particular, around what is the right, really the right balance of uses and development activities uh, on the downs. And we've been using the zone to the kind of best of our ability to to go through the master planning process. And we're really trying to balance um, a lot of different goals for the project and for the property. And as we dig into it, and as we understand market demand, and we understand infrastructure costs, and um, what's sort of ripe for development in the near term versus the longer term, we've identified some, some uses and some uh, zoning changes that we've brought before the Long Range Planning Committee and the, and the Town Council for first reading. Uh, really, we think to kind of round out the zoning and, and, and put the right development package together for, uh, for the property. So we have two different sets of amendments. There's uh, what we would consider kind of fairly modest amendments that are text amendments, which is, I think, this item on your agenda. And then the next item is, is actually a zoning map update. Um, so I'm going to touch on the text amendments and I think the, the primary, the lead uh, proposed uh, text change or set of text changes is, is around allowing for some new uses, allowing for some of the things you just talked about, <laughs> um, 
under the last item on your agenda, allowing for manufacturing, allowing for research, light industrial, really more kind of economic development, uh, employment type uses that can, can round out the project and, and really provide a good balance of development, not just residential, not just kind of commercial, <coughs> but also more of that economic development kind of uh, light industrial type uses. And so there's a proposal in your package around allowing for these uses. Um, I'm just going to jump to a slide here. In a particular, for whatever reason, my computer's not changing slides, but I'll keep talking about it. Um, in a particular area on the site, really to, to kind of limit where those types of development activities occur, and that would be up towards the Payne Road area of the property. Um, and that's the area of the property that we see as really more of kind of the, the business end of the property, the, the portion of the property closest to uh, the highway in terms of mobility for um, employees coming to the site. Um, some levels of truck traffic can be best accommodated off of Payne Road going to the turnpike. It's also the area of the property that's kind of close to those types of uses. There's the Ginn Road area that, that is more kind of industrial in nature. Um, so we're proposing it in that area of the property. There would be standards around only being allowed within 1,450 feet of Payne Road, um, and also with some fairly robust buffers to residential zone um, to the east, to a 250-foot buffer to Payne Road, um, as well as a 250-foot <coughs> buffer to Downs Road. So it really would be. <coughs> These types of uses really would be kind of isolated and buffered uh, on that portion of the property. Um, we're proposing this, actually taking cues from the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan actually calls for kind of manufacturing technology research type uses to be allowed um, in this district. They aren't allowed right now, uh, but the comprehensive plan allows for those. And there's really very strong kind of market demand in Scarborough but also in Greater Portland for these, these types of uses. I think there's less than a 2% vacancy throughout the region in terms of uh, these types of uses. So we think there's a need. Uh, we think it's a positive, would be a positive change for Scarborough in terms of getting more of the region's fair share of these types of uses. And we think uh, the package that the Long Range Planning Committee uh, endorsed and the, and the Town Council supported at forced reading um, is a balanced proposal that kind of buffers those uses, has them kind of fit into the property, but in a limited way and with significant tr controls by the Planning Board. So that's the, the primary kind of text request um, before you in your package. Um, a second one is around allowing for um, a gas station allowance only, again, at the Payne Road <coughs> end of the property, and specifically within 1,000 feet of the intersection of Payne Road and the Downs Road. And we see this as a, an amenity for the project, um, an amenity for some of the uses that I just mentioned in terms of convenience and um, um, in use. And we also see it as you know, um, a way to prevent kind of traffic impacting the larger community. The, we anticipate the Downs will have some destination type uses um, and, and ultimately some office, some commercial that's drawing from throughout the region or maybe out of state. So having a gas station amenity really can be uh, complementary and also prevent people kind of driving around town to, to find a fueling station. So. Um, with this amendment, like the last one, we're being very kind of specific about allowing for it only in a very limited portion of the project, uh, similar to how the town has allowed for gas stations in other areas, uh, measuring from a distance um, around intersections so that they don't just occur, say, throughout the project or kind of happen along, uh, gradually along Payne Road. The, Another component of the, uh, the proposed changes is around um, construction activity and earthwork on the project. Um, as I think the planning board is, is aware, development projects are typically allowed to 
you know, obviously do site work. They're allowed to uh, excavate material from their site and use them on their site, um, store material during construction. That's customary as long as it, projects are following proper erosion control and, and, and state and local requirements around that. The Downs is a pretty unique site where um, it's much larger than your typical development project. And so we thought it was, would be wise and useful to include some specific standards around how construction activity can occur to give um, the applicant direction on how that can be managed, to give abutters some protection around construction activity, to give the planning board um, some, some guidance and some uh, leverage on how construction activity occurs. So we've included some performance standards around that so that there can be um, excavation on the site that to extract material that can be used um, on other portions of the site for construction uh, that we think can reduce overall impacts of construction and not trucking from other parts of the community, um, but rather have the project be fairly self-sufficient in terms of uh, material extraction and storage and really to, um, and to provide some guidance around how that happens. Um, so we included operations plan, we included um, some best practices that when a project comes through, the planning board can review that and understand and kind of condition how uh, that operation occurs on the site. And um, lastly, uh, I think the fourth text amendment or kind of topic around the text amendments is updating some of the, um, the buffer standards, um, both along the main roads. Uh, right now, within the, the Crossroads District, there isn't the same kind of landscaping requirements along the main streets, along Route 1, Haggis Parkway, and Payne Road as the adjacent zones. So the B3 along Route 1 requires a 15-foot landscape buffer. The Crossroads District doesn't include that. Um, similar is true on Haggis Parkway and Payne Road, even though the, the Crossroads District is next to those same zoning districts. So we've included language so that the streetscape or the landscaping standards are the same, depending on the street that the project faces. And we've also um, proposed a change to the buffering between the Crossroads District and commercial zones um, right now there's a 50-foot buffer requirement between the Crossroads District development and commercial zones, which isn't typically required of between um, commercial districts. So we're proposing to eliminate that buffer requirement and have the planning board um, condition buffers at the master plan level. Um, you reviewed the master plan for phase one, and part of that is buffering. So rather than having sort of a carte blanche 50-foot buffer regardless of the two different um, zones and land uses next door to each other, we're recommending that be left to the master planning process. Because um, in some cases, uh, the project would actually want to interface with the development that's uh, next door. For example, Enterprise Business Park is in a butter. Um, and there's actually plans and intentions of interconnecting with Enterprise Business Park and rather, rather than buffering between the two. Um, and we think that that would be a positive change to, to provide more flexibility on, on the interconnections between uh, this project and, and some neighbors. Um, so I think that's an overview of the, um, the zoning text amendments, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you, Dan. Does anyone on the board have, I'm sorry, <clears throat> jumped the gun there. Uh, this is also a public hearing, so is there anyone from the public that would like to speak in relation to this topic. Please approach the podium, state your name and address. All right, seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment portion of this. And does anyone from the board have any questions or comments regarding this? Rachel. Yeah, Dan, um, I'm looking at the gas station and there are actually two gas stations fairly close on Payne Road. How far away are they from where this would be proposed? The, probably the closest one is closer to exit 42, um, and I'm not exactly sure how far away it is. I think it's pr 
probably a third of a mile, something like that. I'm going to guess. And on, on the, the other side, side on Gorham street. Road, the Cumberland Farms? Yeah, that's a good bit further away. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that that's a mile and a half, but a mile. but I haven't conducted those measurements, okay. so those are ballparks for you. I, I, I think what I was thinking of as I looked at some of the things that were going to be here is that we're, we're talking um, short-term and long-term. In other words, as we start to look at things like pet care facilities, uh, the gas station with a... Um, with perhaps a deli attached or a convenience store, they're going to get their most business or start to get businesses once the houses are built and the, the park is built, the, uh, the industrial area is built. So to me, I'd be really interested in how that's being phased in because mm -hmm. I, I can see the need for a gas station. I can also see the need for it closer to what could be the town center. Uh, because there actually are two gas stations on, on Payne Road that, that aren't that far apart. Um, I also saw something here that said um, under the motor vehicle repair and service, uh, the opportunity to relocate existing businesses off primary corridors. Again, that's both a good thing and a is that new businesses that are coming or is it businesses um, that you're thinking about that could eventually leave us with empty stores on Route 1. And, and that's a, that becomes a, a concern. So it's less than what you're going to do with it than it's how it's going to be done. And, and I understand we're looking right now at what your proposals are, uh, you know, what the, what the changes would be, but I do have some concerns <coughs> about the, the how. Bit of comment, or I can let the board continue to provide feedback. Yeah. Um, in terms of the proposed use changes, there's really kind of two buckets from our perspective. Um, there's primary and secondary, particularly around manufacturing and technology, and um, that's those are the primary uh, amendments that we see as critical for for the project and for the community. Um, we really want to create the opportunity for uh, technology, uh, innovation, a kind of manufacturing district, um, park, we used to say park, but I feel like that's an old term, so district, um, and there's really strong demand for that, for manufacturing space, for kind of innovation, technology, of course breweries are popular, we don't think we're going to move Bayside down here, but maybe there would be some amount of that. But we. Those are, that's the primary goal, is to provide new contemporary space for economic development, employment, high tax revenue and generators, and creating activity that leads to housing and vice versa. It also leads to other commercial development. So that's at the forefront. That's sort of the primary goal with these changes. Secondary is um, there are some more kind of light industrial service type uses that we think are appropriate to be interspersed with those. You mentioned auto repair, and that's not to um, kind of steal them away from their sites that they exist today, but the fact of the matter is there is not a lot of space in the town of Scarborough for those types of operations to say leave Route 1 to find a new space that maybe is more affordable or more appropriate than than Route 1. Route 1 is modernizing in a way that everybody knows that is calling for different types of uses than auto repair um, and that aren't maybe fitting in anymore to certain areas of Route 1, say Oak Hill or Dunstan. So this is a secondary allowance that would provide <coughs> a home for those uses that are maybe no longer the highest and best use. Um, similar to that would be a pet care facility that's you know think we're going to attract a bunch of pet care facilities it's just more of an accessory type use that um, makes sense perhaps 
would a lot of activity <coughs> within the district or out of convenience. So that's to try to break it down. Those are the way we've gone about kind of putting forward these amendments, primary and secondary. Uh, I noticed one other thing down here on, the, uh, on page five. Um, one of the things you're looking at is relief from commercial design standards. Could you explain that, please? Right now, um, the entire commercial design standards apply to the entire district. Um, and that was, I think, probably by design because there weren't sort of more of the manufacturing light industrial uses allowed for. Um, so some of these uses are hard to put a cupola on or a peaked roof or kind of have comply with um, what's customarily found in the commercial design standards. So um, <coughs> the proposal is in for these specific uses to not have to provide strict adherence to the commercial design standards because often their building design uh, doesn't correspond as well as typical commercial development. So essentially, are you looking for a blanket relief or are you looking for a way to prov ask for waivers? Uh, we're looking to have that be addressed during the master planning process by the planning board. Um, I mean, somewhat similar to discussions around kind of the first residential <coughs> phase. You know, what is the character of phase one? What's the aesthetic of, of that? Um, we'd look for to work with the planning board at that level on, you know, what's the design theme of, say, an innovation district or a technology district? Um, and can it, can that be created through the master planning process rather than following the commercial design standards that are fairly blanket, that are maybe not uh, crafted for these types of, this type of, these types of buildings or this type of development? Given that this is coming in, um, th this is going on, would it be better, do you think, for the town to really look at the commercial design standards as a whole and to start to examine them with a view towards changing as the, as the building, as the buildings in and the uses in Escapro do change? Might that be an approach to follow rather than on an individual development? Um, it's a potential approach. I mean, that's, I think that's a more of a town discussion as to, okay, is that going to be a short-term initiative that, that the town's going to proceed with, or is that a longer-term initiative? And does that apply to this project only, or is that more of a <coughs> town-wide question? I mean, I think Tigus Parkway is an example of somewhere in between the design standards and what we're talking about. Um, I think, you know, there's been some good good buildings put up that um, are, you know, somewhat, again, somewhere between New England architecture and kind of, kind of metal building. So uh, I, don't, I don't know specifically. I think it depends on what the town wants to do. I think it'd be good here, too, just to, Thank you. to say at this point that, you know, where, where we have the Crossroads District, it is just encompassing the Downs property. And I think what they're looking for is kind of a an outside framework knowing full well that they're going to be in front of us again with their master plans and with uh, the requests as they go in the architecture. And of course, they're extremely sensitive to the market demands um, and what will be changing. And, and ultimately, I think this board uh, has that flexibility to keep reconsidering these items as they come. However, at the outset, they want, they want that initial framework to be able to work with uh, their potential suitors for any of the properties that they're developing. So they just kind of keep you know, the con that context in front of us as we go through these this language. Um, Jane, did you yeah, have something just, to Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I think that the comments <coughs> that Ms. Henderson were bringing up were, were brought forward during our discussion with the Long Range Planning Committee as well. And I know as part of that, one of the, the sort of areas of discussion where really, you know, the discussion around relief from the commercial design standards is really sort of in that one pocket, as uh, Mr. Bacon described, so a northeasterly pocket of the property. I think I've got that about right. Um, and as I recall, I, the Long Range Planning Committee, in discussion with, with the Crossroads team, really talked about ensuring there was like a 100-foot buffer around the area, so it almost becomes a 
an island of industrial or light industrial type activities rather than sort of having buildings that might not have to meet those design standards right next to other buildings or parts of the uh, overall development scheme that would um, just for what that's worth. I just pl unplugged it and plugged it back in. I should have done that <laughs> 15 minutes ago. <laughs> but as Mr. Chase indicated, this shows uh, the location uh, that we're talking about up. I know it doesn't show you the whole uh, plan on your screen, but the image in the bottom left is shows that quadrant of the property up by Payne Road. And, um, you know, really the kind of a concept of what a district or subdivision might look like, and then example type buildings. Um, Do we have any more comments? From the um, I guess first I'm wondering how often it is that developers get to initiate um, ordinance and zoning changes. I mean, how often does that happen? So. There's a provision in the ordinance, and, and pro property owners are um, have the ability to bring forward zoning amendments. So, um, how often does it happen? Upon occasion, I think at least annually we see one, and, and sometimes there's like this one, you know, um, early cooperation between staff. I think uh, one we'll see here coming up later tonight. Bluebird self storage is a sort of a good example of one that came forward within the last year so mm -hmm. happens upon occasion okay. um, so can can you remind us too of the process that that's that's happening as far as um, the planning board will have an opportunity to weigh in on on master planning and I guess would, do we equate that to sort of like a subdivision review kind of a thing where we're looking but I know that this, we're talking about hundreds of acres here, and um, I, I guess if we miss something in master planning, is there going to be another opportunity for us to, to weigh in? Because um, I think it feels a little bit like the tail wagging the dog um, on, in this process so far. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, where would the planning board have the opportunity to weigh in if, for example, the relief from commercial de design standards was blanket? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, where do we have the opportunity to weigh in? So just, just so we're clear when we're talking about relief from commercial design standards, you're really only talking about it in that one yep. pocket of area. It's not blanket mm -hmm. for the whole parcel. I just want to be sure that that's... Mm -hmm clear. Um, so if that is a relief that's granted, then that would be part of the zoning ordinance. And, um, but as, so I think your, your initial question was sort of a reminder of the process. Yeah. So the Crossroads Plan Development District is, definitely has one of our more elaborate review processes, given that it is 500 plus minus acres under one common ownership. Um, that was, um, so back in 2013 when it was approved, there's really sort of, I guess I don't even know how many steps there are, so I'll just sort of start at the beginning. There's the, um, what starts with the preliminary infrastructure plan, um, an overall conceptual master plan for the entirety of the property. And that's a very high level review, and essentially to ensure that development doesn't happen at a piecemeal level, so that you, know, you don't potentially develop one section that then cuts off access to other uh, otherwise available lands or mm -hmm. um, doesn't sort of think about utility corridors or connections and those sorts of things. Um, from that overall conceptual master plan, which sort of encompasses all the holdings, the applicant is then able to zoom in on uh, master plans of um, 50 acres, mm -hmm. pods of 50 acres. So as board members, you know, right now we're working through the first pod or phase, whatever we're calling it, which is the residential component down by phase one. And that has a sort of a, a master plan component to it before you get to your site plan and subdivision review processes. Um, so there's really sort of the, a, a zooming in, if you will. Um, and so that would happen with each subsequent phase. Um, so 
when and if the, the phase, what has been referred to as phase two, this, this sort of light industrial area as we're talking about now, I think it's been identified largely as being the next phase that we may see. Of course, things change as it goes, but um, at least at this time, that's our expectation. Okay. That would start with a master plan review, and mm -hmm. the board would start with a discussion about what are the appropriate space and bulk standards here. Mm -hmm. um, so. So if we don't if we don't give sort of like the uh, relief from uh, commercial design standards now, would we still have the opportunity to do it for when the pod is being developed, or is are we talking about that pod right now? So, nope. Right now, this is you're talking about the zoning, the, mm -hmm. the, the crossroads. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about. I mean, right. there are <laughs> within the zoning there are different pods, but. Right now, what the zoning says is there's a standard that says commercial design standards apply to all development right. in the crossroads. So there's a current standard that yeah. would make it applicable. Mm -hmm. um, and now the board, like with all projects, can waive provisions, but um, it does, the starting point would be the hidden standards rather than, again, yeah. where I think they're talking more light industrial industrial type. Yeah, and I understand what Mr. McGee said about, um, you know, allowing the flexibility for the developers um, to attract certain um, certain businesses by being able to be nimble with the design standards. But I feel like they are crafted for a reason, so I'm not sure why we would why we would waive them at this point. Um, I guess I would also agree with. Um, Rachel. Rachel, thank you. I was looking at the gas station regarding um, the fact that, um, well, let me ask, is the gas fueling station one of the primary or secondary um, sort of buckets that you were talking about? I was talking about those really in the <clears throat> light industrial. Okay. Uh, that's a different bucket. Okay. It's a third bucket. Um, so I guess... A, go ahead. Um, the gas station mm -hmm. seems superfluous um, in that... It's not really a high tax revenue um, area. It doesn't have a, you know, it's not a high job sort of area that we're gonna try to attract to the town. Um, and it just seems like a low return on investment given the uh, potential environmental issues that would be around uh, the spills that happen on a daily basis in this area, knowing that we are fairly close to some very environmentally sensitive um, um, and carefully mapped wetlands in this area. So I, I would not necessarily be, I, I was disappointed, I guess, to see a, such a large develop, um, gas state, you know, fueling station there, knowing, as Rachel said, there is one on each end of the, the, the intersections on that section of road. Um, and then with respect to performance standards for earthwork, material extraction, and construction activities. Um, I, I see that you're suggesting some performance standards, but, um, but I'm not sure that it goes far enough. Um, for example, um, the performance standards that you're suggesting, for example, 15B, um, notwithstanding contrary provisions, ex excavation may occur below the seasonal high water table for the purpose of creating water features within the development project. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess by water features, I'm wondering if you mean stormwater ponds and the like, um, or if you've even thought of having a dewatering plan. And um, I guess I'll stop there and let you respond because I have a few more things on the excavation. Sure, we were, we were thinking about stormwater facilities also other water features like a, you know, a pond for mm -hmm. aesthetic purposes, for mm -hmm. habitat purposes. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a specific plan in mind, um, but it's for all of those items. And um, you know, the, we tried to build these standards to provide the planning board and DEP a lot of oversight in terms of we're not trying to, um, we, we want to meet all applicable regulations in, in doing these types of things so that you have a lot of oversight and leverage in terms of these activities and how that excavation occurs. Yeah, I guess I, I'd, need, I'd need more detail. I think we're missing some dewatering um, uh, details. I think we're also missing 
um, where the excavation would be planned. I'd, I'd definitely want to have a detailed plan there. And maybe you've already had to do this for your um, DEP land, um, sorry, land uh, mining um, permit. But it's definitely something that I think the town should weigh on in on where it's going to be stockpiled and where the digging will, will occur. Um, that would be part of this planning process that would be presented to the planning board. So we haven't yeah. gotten that far. We need to have I'd like to also just guidance add, yeah, around This that. is about the zoning and what's allowed on the site rather than where and when and how it will be conducted is whether or not it's, a, it's this, even allowed on yeah. the CPD zone. So have we have we then, as far as like the inventory, the site inventory, have we mapped sand and gravel aquifers, mm -hmm. wetlands, and the like? Because all of that would be, and if I'm missing it, you know, on the maybe it's already on the G drive or, or something like that, the um, that we have, but I haven't seen it yet. So if somebody could point me to where that is, that has the inventory of where everything is so far, that would be fantastic. And I, and I get that, um, I, I guess I just feel in general that these performance standards don't go far enough to make sure that there is um, appropriate provisions and because there's a lot of uh, mining activity that's going on in other communities that becomes very contentious and very litigious. And so I'd want us to pay very close attention to um, the material extraction and earthwork standard. Right, and this is just to be clear, these allowances are only for development and use occurring on site. This yep. isn't a gravel pit for... Nope, I totally get it. But you got 500 acres there that's going to be a lot to develop. Yeah. And we've already said that's as big as the peninsula in the old port. So it's, it's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd like to make sure that not only dewatering, but erosion and sedimentation controls in the main, um, that statute is complied with. And I'm wondering what we're, what you're talking about under 15C when it says um, shall comply with a site plan and operations plan. What are you, you know, do we have a template for what that's going to look like? Is it a DEP template? Yeah, I think that's what you're, in a few of your earlier comments, asking for. You know, yep. when this language is allowed for, then... At time of planning board application, we submit a site plan to show, okay, these are the locations where extraction is occurring, these are the locations where material is stored, this is the erosion control plan, these are the dewatering plans, all of the operations plans that go along with that activity. So this is laying the, fr the framework for yep. a submission to the planning board. I guess what I'm saying is a lot of other towns are dealing with this right now and may yeah. have already, I just, I mean... I don't want us to have to recreate the wheels. So maybe could we go to Cumberland or Wyndham or others to find sure. out where, where um, mining and extraction has been an issue. And then last, I guess, um, 15D, where it says any deviation and changes to the operations plan must be approved in advance by the planning director. Um, if the planning board has to review and approve it, why wouldn't changes go back to the planning board? Yeah, I think the proposal was to start with the planning director. If the planning director wasn't comfortable in making those changes, they can always okay. Could we bring it that to the such? planning board. Yeah, that would be good to reflect. Yeah. You know, I guess that would be my recommendation to do that. And then um, oh, I had one other, but it's escaped me. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass and I'll let you know if I think of it. Roger, do you have any, uh, anything to add, please? Um, I can appreciate where my colleague is coming from with um, her knowledge about all these things, but my, I'm inclined to accept most of these things right now because this is a long-phased project, and I know you're struggling to try and figure out the best, you know, what what's going to fit there best and what's you know what, what the market's going to be and and things such as that. As an example, with the with the uh, service station. Is that a, a definite, or could that, you could possibly, I, my, my impression is you want that flexibility in case you want to put it there, but it may not be there. That's know? true, and there's, all, there's beyond just serving users in the project or motorists along Pain Road, there are some catalyst projects or catalyst users that could go on this site that may demand a service station be part of the project, yeah. and they're of significance that we don't want to have we don't want to turn them away in light of, of that 
limitation. Um, so we tried to be very kind of balanced um, and specific about this where it's provided for, but it's provided for in, the, in a limited location, um, in a location that we think does the least harm on the site. And um, we really wouldn't want it in the core. We really wouldn't want it down on Route 1. You know, the Payne Road location makes the most sense for a variety of reasons. And it, and it's, um, it could be a really important component to other development that I think the town would be really glad to see and proud of. Um, so, I mean, you're working with SEGCO, you're working with the planning department, and um, I'm inclined to um, give you the flexibility at this stage because we're going to be visiting. I mean, it's evident already you've been before us and other, other committees in town already on numerous occasions for different things. So um, it's almost like a feeling out process to see what you can do and, and what's going to be able to work there to make the most sense for everybody. So I'm inclined to you know, go along with this at this point, recognizing that you know, we're going to be looking at all this stuff later on anyways. Thank you, Roger. Um, I too, I'll just throw my two cents in, um, you know, because when we look at this and what we're trying to do here with the zoning, it, it to me the real question that we should be asking ourselves as a board, as a public, and, and this is going to go before the council before any action actually takes place, correct? This is going to be yes. up on, we're here to provide some comments and um, for the council to consider. I, you know, as I look at this, take that 30,000 foot view level, the real question here is, do we want in this area, this zone on this property, do we want to allow things like pet care, a gasoline station? And they that's the question we're asking ourselves. Are these some of the allowed uses we want to see in that portion of this development? And I don't think it's out of character to put a gas station that's actually right across the street from another gas station. It doesn't seem to disrupt the character of the area of town anyways, because there's a gas station right nearby. So uh, as I look at this, I don't think it's um, anything that's out of the ordinary. I don't. I think we we get so many bites at this apple as we go. Um, the one thing I would um, I, I would tend to agree with with um, I believe it was Robin's <coughs> comments was um, the commercial design standards and you know I I would be more comfortable seeing I think I'd probably be more comfortable seeing you guys request waivers than just to flat out say you don't need them. Um, and that, that's just kind of a gut inclination behind how, you know, and unless there's a really good reason to say commercial design standards should not be considered here, we've all seen the, the projects you're proposing and they're, they're great. They look fantastic. You do a good job. We get it. But uh, I think to ask us to just put aside all commercial standards, not entirely comfortable with it. That's just a personal mm -hmm. feeling. Um, but I would say that I think it would be very open to more of a waiver process or more, you know, or if I at least had a good a specific, you know, argument as why we can't comply with all the commercial design standards mm -hmm. right off the bat, you know. That, that would be just my personal feedback on what I'm seeing here. Um, as far as the things with, you know, the proposed uh, earthwork, um, you know, I understand uh, it's a big site. You don't want to, you know, you want to have a spot to work on there. And currently, it's just not permitted. And it makes sense to me that you want it to be permitted there for specifically this use and no others. And I think you've done a good job limiting how you would use the earthwork area specifically for this site. So it's not going to be dragged from this site to other parts of town and other developments that you're working on. It's not what it's for. Um, so I, I'm okay. I'm comfortable with that aspect of this. Um, so at that point, I think I'll leave my comments there. I'd like to give a more clear sense to the council of our overall sentiment on what's being asked of us, which is um, do these proposed uses, uh, these things that we could see happening here in this district um, as far as what would be allowable. Um, you know, just a quick straw poll. I mean, I, I think what I'm seeing proposed for possible uses on the property are, are, are fine from what I'm seeing. Yes, go ahead. Just a question on those uh, commercial design standards. Yes. If, um, if we don't, you know, offer you some relief on that right now, uh, do you see that as inhibiting your effort to market? Well, I think there's kind of two things. One is I think some of the, the uses proposed can 
can and will willingly meet the design standards. I mean, there's going to be some technology companies that want to really have a great building, a strong presence, and and would have no trouble meeting design standards. I think there's some others that are still valuable uses that would be in a more kind of light industrial setting that um, the board may want to be approving, but it's not going to meet all of the commercial design standards. Um, and having some flexibility there, I think, is going to benefit everyone. I, from past experience, have seen some times where <laughs> Do you like the project? Do you think uh, the building elevations did the best they could for the use that it is? It's kind of contemporary, and it doesn't meet these design standards they're asking for maybe more New England style this or, you know, um, cedar siding that. So this isn't trying to get away from high building value and important users. Um, it's trying to be kind of realistic around a manufacturing technology kind of more in light industrial area that um, can be compensated with buffering or can be compensated with just different architecture. So it's not uh, so much around um, cheaper design or any of that type of thing. Um, and the other component of it is if it says you have to meet the design standards in the zoning district, zoning standards aren't waivable typically when a site plan standard is. So in the town site plan ordinance or other town site plan ordinances, that's an ordinance typically where you can grant waivers more easily or at all versus zoning. So if there's going to be a waiver provision um, that should be built in in a way that is sort of outside the zoning in the site plan um, to give you some discretion. And I think that's why I was offering the master plan process. We can't go <laughs> to site plan without a master plan approval. Um, so more than any other zone in this town, the planning board has a lot of uh, say and input and kind of control at the master plan stage on any part of this project. Um, but this part in particular, where you can say these are some design criteria, or these are architectural standards you need to meet. They can be different than design standards. They can be customized for uh, the nature of this area. Um, so I think that provides an opportunity, a really good opportunity, to come up with the right design criteria for the type of activities we're talking about that kind of fits, versus trying to make the design standards fit something it's, they're not really designed to fit. Um, so, so, Nick, looking at the first page of um, the memo that's provided, it looks like there are five amendments that are required. Um, updating the boundaries, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Um, allowing for manufacturing, I'm in agreement with all the, the proposed uses, except for the um, relief from commercial uh, uh, standards. Um, I, the third one, um, I'm not in agreement with the um, gas fuel station, but others have said that they are. Um, four, establishing controls for construction activities. That one needs work, I believe, and then I would be in agreement with the fifth one. It's a, actually kind of a helpful way to go through this. Rachel, do you <laughs> have some guidance on... Yeah, I'm pretty much tracking um, where Robin's coming from and the district <coughs> boundaries I'm in agreement with, the allowing for manufacturing research light industrial I'm in agreeing with, the uh, gas or fuel station, um, I, I, would, I guess I would have to say not at this time. Um, mm. So if that has to be taken as a no, then that's what it is, but it's, it's a not at, not at this time. Uh, the control, controls for construction activities, I do have uh, one concern, and that is around the, uh, the creation of water features. And it seems to me if somebody, if the, if the folks want to create a water feature as part of a landscaping plan, then they would come to us with a, a way to do that, and we would at that point consider a, a waiver, um, and I don't, I don't know uh, I don't, I, I'm not an expert like Robin is on taking a look at excavations and high water tables and everything else. But I think uh, 
a water feature may have a very good role in the landscaping and the, uh, the presentation of the whole uh, project. But that's a case of, so come to us and say, I want to put in a water feature, and this is how I need to do it. And then, uh, uh, otherwise, the rest of the construction activities are fine. And adjusting the landscape and buffering requirements of the CPD district, I'm in favor. That's fine. Roger, do you have uh, some guidance for me on this? Um, my guidance for you? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I don't have a problem with any of those right now because I feel confident that, you know, we're going we're gonna to revisit almost all of these things uh, at some point in the future. And I think at this stage, they're still working this out to try and figure out what's, what's going to work best for this. As far as that industrial area, um, that's isolated from the, almost the rest of the property. Uh, I, I, I would venture to say most people who are going to be living in that whole area may not even see it, or pay attention to it once it's there. So I, I, I'm, I'm inclined not to restrict them in terms of what they're trying to do at this stage. And we could, I, I believe we can go back later on if we need to, to um, make any, any changes or adjustments. Thank you. It's probably a good point. If there are no real standards, we probably could implement, you know, require more out of you at the end of it if we didn't like something, um, or it could go the other way, which is you guys would argue that there's no standards and you can put whatever you want there. So um, I think that's the tricky part of this. So um, I am in agreement with Roger on virtually all of your five points here. Um, you know, with again outlining my one concern about those design standards, understanding too that you know you guys are looking for flexibility. Um, which I believe you should have in, in that section of this project. So I guess for uh, Karen, who is going to take pretty good notes on this, um, our collective uh, membership here is um, largely in agreement on the three of the five points uh, with some reservations from some, half of the board members, half of the current board members present for uh, the gas and for the um, construction material activities, the earthwork material activities, would be what we would like conveyed to the council as they consider this proposal. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate your time tonight. And then we have. There's another one that will next. On the map. Yeah, next uh, order uh, line of business is the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map. And Mr. Bacon, would you like to? I think you touched on this already, but um, did. the Crossroads Plan Development District, I think, as you know, is um, was originally proposed to apply to the well most of the Scarborough Downs property. I almost said the entire Scarborough Downs property. Uh, with the exception of the area of the property that abuts Haggis Parkway, at the time that was, uh, and still is, left in the Haggis Parkway district because it has frontage on Haggis Parkway um, and a connection to Haggis Parkway. <coughs> when um, the applicant acquired this property, it was identified that the property boundaries um, are incorrect on um, the tax assessor's information, which is... Also, uh, the, the property lines and the information that the zoning, uh, dist zoning district follows. So this is a proposal to update uh, the Crossroads Plan Development District to follow the correct property boundaries, which is shown on, on this image. Um, and so in a variety of places, most notably to the northeast, um, the boundaries are different, and uh, so to correctly follow uh, the property boundaries, as well as to add in the area um, that abuts Haggis Parkway, that is currently zoned um, Haggis Parkway District. Um, that's so. That's what's before you is to um, to have the CPD follow the essentially the in, the entirety. Of property boundaries of the Downs, with the exception of 
what I'll call three fingers. And those three fingers are three narrow connections of the property to two down to Route 1 um, and one to Sawyer Road. And we're proposing to leave those out of this rezoning, um, principally because they're so narrow and they, ab they abut different zones. So we wanted uh, a long Route 1. It's a B3 zone. Rather than rezoning these narrow fingers as the Crossroads District, uh, we're proposing to keep them as B3. Um, and along Sawyer Road, it's um, the Village Residential 4 District, a residential zone. And again, as opposed to rezoning this narrow finger, we propose to keep it the same um, so that it's subject to the standards in those districts. Um, but with the exception of those, um, the map would be updated to, to um, follow this, the parcel as, you, as it appears on your screen this evening. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, we'll open up the public comment section of this. If anyone has any comments, please approach the podium. State your name and your address. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, does anyone here on the board have anything to offer on this? Yes, Roger. I, I'm just kind of curious, uh, Dan, on uh, those parcels A and B. Are those buildable? Um, there's buildable land on both, yeah. There's okay. also wetlands on both. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Um. yeah. I would note that we've, prior to this evening and prior to the council's first reading, we've notified the abutters around these areas and had uh, conversations with uh, some of them. Uh, in addition, the land trust is a major abutter to the east. Um, and we've actually had a meeting with the land trust board to talk about the project in general, the rezoning. So we've conducted outreach uh, regarding the changes. So that that's, uh, section A, that would be abutting the industrial section we were talking about earlier, wouldn't it? It would be part of the... Uh, yeah. It would, yep. Okay, well, <coughs> the way you're going, if you wait a few more weeks, you might get some more land. <laughs> I could have lost some, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all set. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments on this? All right, so I think at this point we'll send our, uh, our blessings on the proposed changes to the council. Thank you. Be it. Thank you, gentlemen, and appreciate your time this evening. All right. Number seven, Rock Church requests a site plan amendment for 66 Gorm Road, Assessor's Map R58, Lot 19. Jamel, would you like to introduce this item? Sure, thank you. Um, just as a reminder, this, is a, this project is located at 58 Gorm Road in the R4 Zoning District. Uh, the applicant was before the board at, in February, <coughs> two months ago. And uh, since then, the building size has been reduced from 13,370 square feet. It's the handheld microphone. The building has been reduced from 13,370 square feet to 10,945 square feet. And also, there's been a reduction of seats from 600 to 450. Uh, as a result of these reductions, <laughs> the applicant is proposing uh, 209 parking spaces in the initial build out, with a total of 47 additional spaces to be built out if warranted. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant provide a seating chart of the auditorium uh, to verify the number of seats uh, as proposed in the application. Um, the applicant is no longer uh, proposing to locate the HVAC units on the building addition. If you remember at the last meeting, uh, that was going to be part of the building addition. It is no longer. Um, so they're maintain proposing to maintain the existing con locations of the HVAC units, and uh, these units will need to be screened using fencing and or vegetation. And finally, um, as the board knows, uh, Gorham Road is being reconstructed this summer um, after Unitil is done. Uh, and ongoing through the summer, and given the project's location on Gorham Road, uh, coordination with the town's road project will be very important going forward. And that's what I have. 
Thank you very much. And just a quick reminder to all of our applicants out there that um, we'd like to keep your presentation to a minimum. Uh, we have clearly received and reviewed all of the materials, so a quick overview and then anything that perhaps staff has brought up that you thought the board should have as a piece of information as we deliberate would be helpful. <coughs> Thank you. State your name. And Great. My name is Tom Greer from Walsh Engineering. Um, what I'll do is give you a very brief overview. We do have a DEP permit. We have an MDOT permit. Uh, we have approvals from the sanitary district, so we're, we think we're ready to go. Um, since the board has seen this last time, uh, we, we have reduced the size of the building slightly. Uh, it looks the same, uh, but it is, it is slightly smaller, so there were some site changes here. Most of the parking and all of that remains the same. What we're asking for is two alternates that we're looking for. Um, the existing building has um, uh, HVAC units that are on both sides of the building, and what the plan shows is bumping those out and putting some landscaping uh, around the front of them and eliminating the parking spaces in those locations so we could get the sidewalk by them. Uh, that's a budget issue. Uh, if we're successful going through all of the budget issues, those will get removed uh, and put up on the roof uh, in this location here, and those will be screened. So we're looking at that as, as an alternate. Uh, and the last alternate that we were looking for was uh, this final row of parking and this parking space here. We think we have enough parking spaces on site that that we don't need those with the redu <coughs> reduction of 150 uh, seats out of it. Um, if we do need those spaces, we'd like the ability to add them back without having to come back to the planning board. Uh, so we've left those as an alternate. Um, uh, those likely would be a grassed area across here that might get used as temporary parking. And if it becomes necessary, it'll get paved. Uh, and we don't think this parking spaces will be needed, but, but if they are, then we certainly are looking to, to put those in. Uh, the goal is uh, to have absolutely no parking on Route 114, and we still remain committed to that um, goal. Uh, there were some architectural questions that I will let um, uh, Dwight answer and go through those. Hi, I'm Dwight Herdrick, Dwight Herdrick Architecture. Um, the piece of the, the uh, Major differences are just the overall size of the building um, is coming in basically five feet on all three sides. Um, the some of the details um, are simpler now. There's not as many fancy brackets and things like that. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, they're right there. <laughs> um, and uh, instead of metal um, siding, now it's just going to be the EFIS, the um, drive it, uh, which most buildings around here are built the same way. Um, so it's, it's pretty much the same, just simpler. Um, and then I did get a request for, um, uh, on Friday for uh, a view of the, from the road of what it would look like if the HVAC units went on top. So I was gonna hand some of these out just so you can see. So you can sort of tell in there that the you these units are the exact size of the real units. Um, and you can just barely see them. And that's also if you're six feet tall, standing right across the street. And if the, uh, I don't have it lowered like you would in, in 3D on those where your, your head height would actually be lower. So basically you can't see them at all, even if they do go on the roof. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you very much. Roger, do you want to check this one? Uh, sure. Um, I still like the uh, design of the building. I think it looks really terrific. It would be nice there. Um, the only um, thing I would suggest is on the additional parking. You had mentioned that you would like to get um, get approval to just, if in case you do need it later on, you want to be able to just do it. Correct. 
And I think it would be more appropriate for, you know, at least to go to, to the planning department and make sure that you're that, not encroaching on any. Yeah, that's fine. We can, we can, we can work it out that uh, with staff approval, we'll, we'll, we'll put that together with staff approval. Uh, and just to be clear, um, it is fully designed on your plans. It's correct. incorporated it into your stormwater approach. And that's it, correct. It's all there. You're just right. simply talking about a reduction at the outset, and the reduction would meet our minimum parking standards. Yeah. I think that's the other thing to, to note, that they are right. proposing to meet our minimum standards but have the capacity for expansion pre-approved, essentially. So you're saying basically if they wanted to just expand the parking, they could go ahead and do it without coming to your department? Well, be, we would... Um, we would probably do a little pre-construction meeting just to be sure that okay, we all know okay. what they're building and right. that okay. it's per the approved plan. Okay, but, all right. Yeah, but they wouldn't have to come back to the board. Or okay, uh, I'm all set on everything else. Thank you. Rob. So, um, are you going to be able to make the time frame and break ground by June 13? <laughs> That's still up in the air. Loaves and fishes. So. Yeah. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the okay. plan is is to uh, be able to do some of the earthwork <laughs> and, okay. and that type of thing. We are not going to have a building permit that quickly, oh, okay. so um, we are hoping that we can get uh, some of the earthwork done and that will constitute Great. a start. Okay. And I'll then just, go ahead. If I could just note, um, you know, it, in. Uh, other type of examples that have been like, you know, people have started with a, a foundation permit, okay. you know, sort of enabled yeah. to sort of get some bits off the ground, and then that's, okay. that's the substantial start our ordinance looks for, and then okay. the other critical pieces can come along. Absolutely. Um, I, I have just two small questions. One is regarding um, the setbacks from the stream and demarcating that appropriately so yep. that the construction stays outside of, you know, the buffer zones and things like that, Tom. Have you given thought to how you're going to demarcate that? Yeah, I, I believe as part of the uh, approval part process, we're talking about um, a line right in here. Okay. And that will be part of the erosion control that goes in first. Okay. And there's a double row of erosion Perfect. control along there. Uh, okay. And so that that separates that area. Super, maybe just bring it up in the pre-construction meeting with yeah. town staff so that the contractor is aware to stay plenty away from that. That would be great. And then um, who will be doing the post-construction inspection and maintenance of the underdrain soil filter? Yeah. Is there um, a contract in place for that yet? That will be done by Walsh Engineering. We'll, okay. do, we'll be available during construction for, for okay. the construction of the two underdrain soil great. filters. and. Uh, complying with the DEP requirements of oversight and monitoring. Super. Uh, as and then, part of that. as part of the MS4 permit, we yep. just need something at the end saying that the town needs something at the end saying that it was designed, it was built as designed and functions as intended. Yep. So I just, just a reminder about yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's part of the DEP requirement. Great. So yep. that'll be there as well. Good. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to weigh in on. I mean, anything else? I think it's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just have, um, a, I guess, a memory check for me uh, on the building design. It was the original proposal, did that have a second floor over? Yes. It is that still still there? So that's part of what's been eliminated is the second floor to make right. it small. Correct. Okay. That's all I need. Thank you. And I don't have a whole lot else to add other than um, you've seen staff comments and willing to work through those, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, <coughs> so what I have here is a, uh, a motion, and it is, uh, I move to approve the project titled Building Expansion 2017 proposed by the Rock Church of Greater Portland as depicted on the plan set prepared by Walsh Engineering Associates, Inc., dated 41018, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct a 10,945 square foot addition with associated parking, landscaping, and stormwater management infrastructure. The property is located within the residential R4 district and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R58, lot 19. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, number one, permit the proposed 22-foot parking aisle widths rather than the town standard of 25 feet. 
conditions prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant will submit A, a full, a full floor plan of the building including a seating chart, B, a revised plan set that includes town's post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance standard note, C, a revised plan set that includes additional screening around the existing HVAC units on the site. D, documentation of the required upgrades up to the fire alarm and sprinkler system in the building. This should, shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number two, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall demarcate the stream setback on the site with construction fencing. Three, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall coordinate the final layout of the underdrained soil filter, number two, with the planning department. And number four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, their site contractors to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? I'm sure that is unanimous. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Grab your shovel. <laughs> Next item is Prompto Oil Inc. Request a site plan review for 318 U.S. Route 1, map U40, lot 4. Jamel. All right, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, this project is located at 318 U.S. Route 1 in the B3 zoning district. Uh, this applicant was last before the board in April, a few meetings ago. And as you may recall, site access uh, to, from the site from Route 1 was one of the primary concerns, um, and since April, since the April meeting, staff, the applicant, and the town's uh, traffic consultant met to discuss the challenges with site access at this site. Uh, the applicant, as a result of the meetings and discussions with the applicant, the applicant has provided a modified design that includes a one-way entrance and exit uh, to Route 1, and staff is generally comfortable with the proposal. Staff, staff and the board also re requested that a sidewalk be constructed along the Route 1 frontage. Um, after further discussion and review of the pedestrian infrastructure along this part of the corridor, staff recommends that the applicant provide funds uh, equal to building or constructing of the sidewalk towards the town's multimodal reserve account instead. And finally, the signage provided by the applicant doesn't appear to conform to the town's design standards. Uh, these details need to be worked out with the applicant. That's what I have. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Again, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Will Conway from Sodego Technics, uh, representing Pronto. Kevin King from Pronto is here as well. Um, you've seen the site plan before. Jamel did a great job of the, you know, deciding uh, determining where we are in the process. Uh, referring to the plan behind you, uh, the issue that we had with the site plan was access on Route 1. So what we're proposing is a right turn in only coming in this entrance. Vehicles would queue here, go through the drive through and then exit in a right turn out there only. And uh, that <laughs> met with uh, tremendous reception from Bill Bray, your traffic engineer. I think everyone is happy with this plan, staff, and we're here for your final approval. That was very brief, and we appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. I want to say one thing. <laughs> you almost made it. <laughs> quick water line to the front that it looks like. But the big thing we had the issue is the sign. I had two different engineers. So here's kind of a conceptual of the sign, what the sign actually would look like, except it has two different letters. And we actually have submitted one with the proper amount of letters. But um, I don't know if you've seen it or not. So this is that conceptual. Hopefully correct. Thank you. I have a burning question. Can I ask it? Go for it. Where's Sean? He's golfing. Okay. <laughs> Every year he goes with his father and, and right. brothers to okay. Ohio. That was very nice of you to so come I'm in his place. Maybe you're his good luck charm, Will. So thank <laughs> you. Um, so is the applicant willing to pay this in lieu sidewalk fee? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, did we have a choice? <laughs> Just a checking. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question, if you will. Um, so my, uh, uh, I have a question and a comment. My question is, 
uh, about on the on the back of the staff comments regarding um, multiple areas on the site where grading goes right up to the edge of the wetland, the planning board should consider a condition of approval which states that protective measures be put in place prior to the start of construction. Have you thought about what those measures would be? I would suggest that a silt fence would be appropriate. That's a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. Uh, normally, we use the erosion control berm mix, but a silt fence is a little mm -hmm. bit more of a uh, rigid, you so, know, don't go over this line. Yeah, but the trouble that I'm having is that wetlands are considered waters of the state, so, you know, maybe a double, you know, silt fence plus an erosion control berm, something like that, because he, here's my comment. This is, remember I said I had a question and a comment? That sometimes just because DEP permits something doesn't mean it should be built. Um, putting something so close to a wetland like this is just doesn't, it, it just blows my mind that DEP will give a permit like this. So I want to know what controls are appropriate if, if double erosion controls might be, um, might be um, appropriate or might be considered by the applicant. And I guess I wouldn't mind staff weighing in on that as well. We would be certainly open to it. I mean, it's a reasonable and, request. And, and I can chime in um, since probably Will's not aware. Um, so Sean did add double erosion okay. sediment controls for us along the Millbrook side okay. all of right. it. That was staff's okay. comments earlier on in the process, Good. Good. Um, but not all the way around the back okay. to the wetland side. Yeah. It was more about the stream side. So yeah. Really so I would just ask that maybe those be extended. And it sounds like, you know, uh, Sean has already been amenable to that and sort of put that in but um just great job finding something that finally worked kevin we so struggled thank with you it. yes <laughs> i mean when you looked at it it's like oh and i turned around and looked at it i was like oh why didn't we think of that before so we're actually there was a plan 10 years ago that was almost exactly oh. <laughs> all right turned well assuming that we all agree welcome to scarborough prompto thank, thank you, you. thank you Rachel? Yeah, I, I just uh, I just want to commend um, the planning staff and the applicant for hanging in there and working on this until we've gotten something that I uh, I think personally um, really meets addresses the needs of the town and I hope the applicant and welcome to Scarborough. Thank you, Roger. Um, yes, I want to just um, thank you thank you for your perseverance <laughs> going through this process. Uh, this has been challenging for you, and I think it's great, and I'm, I'm glad you're going to be here, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I don't have a lot to add other than, uh, of course, we're, we're glad that you did hang in there. Um, we, we figured there was probably a solution somewhere, and I'm glad we arrived at it. Um, so with that, I will make the draft, mo uh, I'm sorry, the motion to approve the project titled Prompto Oil Change Facility proposed by Prompto Inc. as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 4-27-18 with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct a 1,650 square foot fully enclosed automobile repair and service facility with associated parking, landscaping, and stormwater management infrastructure. The property is located within the general business B3 district and is identified on the town of Scarborough tax maps as map U40, lot 4. The planning board has reviewed the application supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. We have several conditions here. Condition number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include A, the addition of entrance only and exit only signs as identified on the traffic peer review memo by Traffic Solutions dated 5518. B, the applicant shall pay an in lieu fee in the amount equal to the estimated construction of the sidewalk along the Route 1 frontage. The funds are to be directed to the town's multimodal reserve account. C, addition of one maple tree, I'm sorry. We did not discuss that, and I will bring this back up, but C, an addition of one maple tree to the east of the proposed site entrance. These reserva uh, revisions shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall adjust and finalize the traffic impact fees as identified on the traffic peer review memo by Traffic Solutions, dated 5518, and provide final payment. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan to the planning department 
thank you for providing that this evening. Um, four, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall put protective measures in place to the edge to the identified wetland on the site. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer of their site coordinator, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. And Robin on the second, and we'll have a discussion real briefly. Uh, maple tree, is the applicant uh, agreeable to adding a maple tree as drafted in this motion? Yeah. Fantastic news. All right. Anyone have anything else to add to the discussion? <laughs> All in favor. So that's be unanimous. Good luck. Welcome to Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you. I missed You got it. We're uh, going to take a five minute recess. Oh, we can. Uh, we're about an hour and 35 minutes well, we into it. Have, we need four people, so. We need four people. You can't have a break, Roger. Come back. <laughs> In the meantime, we will introduce the next item, which is number nine, Rosewood Lane Development, which has been tabled at the request of the applicant. So we'll go to number 10, Contour Properties LLC, requests a subdivision amendment review for H Science Park, Assessors Met R77, Lot 3B. Jamel. All right. Just a reminder, this is located in the Business Office Research Zoning District. Uh, this applicant was before the board uh, in January. Uh, several meetings ago, and since then has provided a revised subdivision amendment application uh, that incorporates staff and board comments. Uh, the applicant is proposing to combine lots 3A and 3B um, into a commercial condominium. Uh, tonight's review will include a subdivision amendment review, and then going forward, the board will review individual site plan applications. Uh, staff recommends that the plan include the location of the Shoreland Zoning Overlay District on the plan. Um, also, a plan note should be added that indicates how the open space will be maintained and who will own it. And finally, the Scarborough Sanitary District is seeking information about the existing sewer infrastructure on the site, and the applicant is encouraged to coordinate with them on this matter. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Introduce yourself, please. Sure. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mike Tadema Wieland. I'm an engineer with Teradyne Consultants. And I'm here with Bob Goudreau, who is uh, a member of Contour Properties, uh, the owner and applicant of Science Park Subdivision. Uh, Science Park Subdivision was originally approved in 1978, I believe. Um, this is a plan of the original subdivision. It was uh, submitted as part of your, uh, your packet on this mission. Uh, lot one of the subdivision, uh, which is located right here, uh, is owned by others uh, and is developed and is, is not under review, not owned by the applicant. Uh, so what the applicant is proposing to do is combine the, the 14 and a half, give or take, acres um, that he owns and as well as, so, so that includes the lots two through six that I mentioned before from the original subdivision, as well as Science Park Drive. Um, this project's been before you a couple times, the subdivision, um, most notably for a site plan amendment for lot two, which was the old foundation for blood research. Um, so out there today is the foundation for blood research building, which is currently being redeveloped into office space. Uh, a, a second structure that was associated with the Foundation for Blood Research that's being redeveloped for a, for a different user, uh, and the, the, the rest of the parcel is undeveloped. So um, the proposal is to create a condominium uh, that includes five total units, um, and I've tried to color those in different colors so you could see, so it would be this sort of green area, this tan area, this rose-colored or pink area, and these two blue-green areas. Those would be uh, condominium uh, limited common element areas for future development. Uh, in addition to that, about five and a half acres, which is this green piece, uh, is intended to be donated to the Scarborough Land Trust. Um, 
just recently, over the past couple of days, the applicant's been in touch with the land trust, and although they haven't um, formally um, had an action in front of their board, they are extremely interested, and it's expected that their board um, would like to accept this as a gift, um, given its proximity to the Nonsuch River and its sensitivity um, because of the, the wetlands on site. So th that's expected to be donated to the land trust. Uh, and uh, and again, the, the, the existing lots are, are proposed to be combined into one. This is a, a greatly simplified application compared to the last one you saw because we've pulled out all the site plan elements. So uh, we, we do intend to come back um, very quickly um, for site plan approval for the individual units that are shown here. But today we're just uh, before you to essentially Wipe the, wipe the lot lines off the plan uh, and create the condominium. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Rachel, would you like to start us off? Um, yes, I'd like to start off by saying I have no questions. <laughs> Fantastic. Roger. Uh, um, I think I'm pretty well all set. I'm going to wait for Rob. <laughs> oh, <Robin>. great. <laughs> Um, I guess <sighs> I have a question on, you know, guess what? Storm <laughs> oh, well. Yes, exactly. Um, no, I know that, tell me, are you meaning, are, is, is post less than pre? Yeah, so <clears throat> we talked a little bit about this last mm -hmm. time I was here. Um, we have, we've got designs for these. Uh, for these individual right. developments. And stormwater is being handled on individual lots. Uh, so today, we're, we're, again, we're just, we just want to create the condominium, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're, not, we're not seeking approval for any of, the, any of these developments. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no stormwater management proposed right now because there's no, okay. there's no real development proposed. When we do come back for the site plan review, Mm -hmm. um, there will be stormwater management proposed in order to to meet the uh, okay. the general standard as well as the flooding standard. Okay, and so um, and it, it, if I sorry to interrupt, but no, please. Th that's that's sort of the pattern we that mm -hmm. was created when we developed okay. uh, when Unit Two and Two A were developed. There, if you remember, there's a okay. um, under drain soil filter. Yep. developed in that area okay. for, for that D development. You don't foresee it being a problem on any of the lots, do you? No. In, okay. in fact, okay. you, you've already seen yep. uh, a stormwater management report for right. this um, back okay. in January, and we've we've pulled it back and, and just to simplify things. And again, okay. taking step one here with the subdivision amendment. Excellent. So I wrote a question saying, oh. how is the wetland going to be demarcated? Um, what did, does that have? I don't know if it necessarily applies here. Yeah, there's no wetland impacts proposed, and okay. uh, and in fact, um, there's no impact proposed within 25 feet of the wetland. Okay. Um, so, not sure. And that would be necessary. Is the, is there going to be a sidewalk built or no? There will be a, a, there's a proposed sidewalk, there will be a proposed sidewalk um, okay. along Science Park Road, along the length of Science Park Road. Okay. And so the, even though it's going to remain a private <coughs> road or street, it's still going to meet town standards when it gets des designed, the road. The road? Yeah. Yes. So the, so the road exists today, mm -hmm. um, and the applicant's in the, in the process of improving it. Is that okay. right, Bob? Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all set. Thanks. Thank you. Roger? Yeah, um, regarding the sidewalk, uh, I think the question is the sidewalk on Route 1. Isn't that the question? What the concern is? And if you're going to have a sidewalk throughout the property, it seems to make sense to have a sidewalk on Route 1. In lieu of the, you know, contributing to the fund. Yeah, so the, 
the applicant uh, feels pretty strongly that a, that a sidewalk on Route 1 is, in fact, truly a sidewalk to nowhere. Um, there's, so the frontage is, is here. And beyond this, there's the, uh, there's the CMP-owned land, and then there's another privately owned land, and then there's the Nonsuch River. And on, I think on the other side of the Nonsuch River is a sidewalk, but um, clearly this isn't going to get anyone anywhere. And in addition to that, there, there are concerns with so the, the wetlands um, associated with the Nonsuch River um, would, would require, would need to be impacted in order to build that sidewalk. So the applicant's pretty adamant about the fact that it, it's, it's not necessary and would really like to see, uh, you know, the board not require that. Um, I'm inclined to agree with the applicant on that. I'm, I may not be, I may get expelled from the board here. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I tend to agree with that, so. I guess, I guess if they don't build the sidewalk, then they put the money into it. Then we'll I guess that's the question to the board. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's also something for a later date, though, based on what we're looking at here yeah, tonight, okay, right? Yeah, okay. That's, but it was in the... It was in the we get to let them fight over yeah. this for three weeks, and then we'll find out more <laughs> where they landed. You, you get to have the same comment come back from staff. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So, um, I mean, if we do want to provide that type of guidance that might help facilitate the next three weeks' worth of discussion, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an option. Nick, Nick, can I just add one thing? You may. Um, one, I think maybe the one of the reasons Roger brought up is we had a, a pretty big discussion about this section of Route 1 and sidewalk, and the Transportation Committee is really weighing towards putting a sidewalk or sidewalks in this area. So that's where his staff comments are coming from, mm -hmm. is the Transportation Committee. Who's on our committee? I'm on that committee. And he was the lone <laughs> voice again. Were you the dissenting <laughs> yes. member? Yes. Yeah. I think he's going to keep that back for <laughs> and, and so would this, this parcel could potentially, though, be eligible for the in-lieu fee to have it go toward? Potent I'm asking. Sure, potentially. Okay. Um, okay. I think in staff's estimation, this is a case where we're close enough to mm -hmm. some existing sidewalk that was built not too long ago, and we worked with partners to bring it further than was originally going to be mm -hmm. developed along Route 1. So we feel like this is, uh, this would be a, a location where staff would advocate for, for the sidewalk development. Okay. Just at the board's discretion. So you don't necessarily agree with the applicant that it's a sidewalk to nowhere? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from board members here? I, I, uh, I like the idea of a sidewalk or in lieu of. I hadn't, uh, I had that noted that originally, um, on the and the work that came out, and I forgot to mention that sidewalk. Well, I guess your next three weeks of discussions will get interesting. I too um, think you should consider it, and I know it goes nowhere now, but always potential down the road, and where we have brought uh, sidewalks up to that parcel already. I think that continuation is something that the town is looking for. Consider that as you go into your discussions. I uh, personally look forward to hearing more about it in a few weeks. Uh, but with that said, I don't have a whole lot else to add to this, so I'll make a motion um, based on the proposal that we're discussing here tonight. Um, I move to approve the project titled Science Park Subdivision, proposed by Contour Properties, LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Teradyne Consultants, LLC, dated 4 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to create a commercial condominium by combining lots 3A and 3B. The property is located within the business office research and Shoreland overlay districts and is identified on the town of Scarborough tax maps as map R77, lots 3A and 3B. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the subdivision amendment adequately addresses the subdivision and zoning ordinance requirements. Conditions, there are two. One. Plan set shall be revised to include A, this town's standard subdivision notes, B, the addition of the zoning districts adjacent to the property, C, a plan note indicating that the land on the plan set identified as open space is to remain as open space. In addition, the note should also indicate the entity that is proposed to maintain the open space. 
Number two, the final approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District is required prior to further development. Approval documents shall be provided to the Planning Department when received by the applicant. That is the motion. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? Further discussion? All in favor? So that is unanimous. Thank you guys. Thank you, folks. seeing you again. Um, that's, uh, we're about to get into some good stuff here, so does anyone want a five minute break before we hit, hit the high tide? You guys good? Yep. Thank Roger, you. you're good? Yeah, I'm good right now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you good, good dude? Check, I'm good. <laughs> Check with me in 45 minutes. Won't be in about 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's an option. All right. Number 11. Waterstone Properties Group, Inc. requests an amended, amended site plan for Lot 7, Scarborough Gallery Subdivision, Assessor's Map, R37, Lot 3307. Jamel, would you like to introduce this, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, this is in the, located in the B2 Zoning District, yeah. and it's the location of uh, the development pad currently in front of Marshall's, Home Goods, and Bob's Discount Furniture along the Scarborough Gallery Boulevard. Um, the applicant was before the board, and... April, several meetings ago, uh, for the proposal for an 8,242 square foot retail building. At the last board meeting, staff identified that one of the primary components to address was the completion of the plan development process due to the fact that the applicant was proposing the location of the building within the required 50 foot front yard setback. Uh, many of these items that are required for the plan development process were reviewed and discussed by the board as part of the 2005 Scarborough Gallery subdivision <laughs> approval. However, the applicant, you know, has requested has provided supplemental information to address these requirements, and staff is comfortable with the materials provided. Uh, the applicant is proposing a 10-foot walkway, um, sort of between the parking lot and the building, uh, instead of the required 5-foot sidewalk and 5-foot landscape provision. Uh, so the applicant should address this with the board. Uh, staff recommends that the electric pull box be relocated uh, close to the dumpster pad on the site and, pr and provide better screening from the public way. And then I'll uh, give, have, give Angela Blanchett, our town engineer, a chance to discuss some stormwater uh, concerns and issues on the site. Thank you. Um, the last meeting that they were in front of the board, um, we talked a little bit about the downstream impacts from in the watershed in general um, towards Muzzy Road. And so we talked about um, where the stormwater is being directed to an existing pond to take a look at um, some maintenance logs and things like that, and then also maybe take a site visit. So I was able to, uh, Jamel and I went out to the site uh, with the design engineer, um, did a walk around the pond, did um, our own inspection. And I was extremely pleased, I think, with the condition out there. I was surprised and very pleased <laughs> with the condition out there. Um, it, there was very little erosion. Um, it was very stable. Um, looked like it had been maintained. The, the question really is about the details. And, um, and I think Woodard and Kern also has chimed in with in their comments, you'd see, um, about showing some documentation of that maintenance that's happened and making sure there's a lot of pipes, I will say, um, there's pipes that are submerged by design that you cannot see. So we don't know if how those are functioning. Um, those should be probably jetted and cleaned or if they have already, that might have already been done, but there's no documentation to show that. Um, and then also, this is a site that triggers a five-year re recertification with DEP. So I'm curious on where they are in that um, process and whether the five years just happened or it's coming or um, because with that comes documentation as well. I think the documentation that was provided to us was during construction and what we're really t asking for is the post construction to show that you're maintaining this as you move forward um, and making sure that is in place to kind of carry on forever more. Um, and then there are um, a few issues just trying to figure out getting our, our hands around um, the uh, treatment efficiencies with the bioretention cells, things like that, um, just needing some more information that I think staff probably can work with the design engineer to get through, but really supplying more documentation is, is really needed. 
and I, I think we just need to maybe be a little clearer. Maybe I wasn't as clear as I could be, and maybe we could work through that with staff. Thank you. And are you all section? All good. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Wayne Morrill from Jones Beach Engineers. With me tonight is Doug Richardson from Waterstone Properties and Eric Poole, my design engineer. Um, as Angela said, we, um, Eric did do a site walk out there. Uh, there were a few things on the pond, some riprap, um, some different things that needed to be updated. Um, I believe there were four items that needed um, some attention on the pond, and we've agreed to take care of those, and we've already, uh, there were some elevations that had to be checked, which we sent our survey crew out to make sure the elevations were per the design, and we can confirm that those were by design. Um, one of the other things that we have done since the last time we are here is we have met with uh, Maine DEP about the amendment to the, uh, the permit itself. We've submitted all the paperwork and we have a verbal that we, are, we have the permit, but we do not have the paper uh, version of the actual amended permit. Uh, but we have supplied them with all the documents that they needed to um, give us the approval for the new DEP on this 8,400 square foot building. Um, as Jamel said, there are a couple of things that we're asking the board. Um, one of those being, uh, we are showing a 10 foot wide sidewalk along the entire frontage. And one of the things that we've um, doing different projects like this, that we notice that there's a lot of different uh, pedestrian traffic in front of these buildings. And when people are opening up those doors to have a large area to be able to have pedestrians moving back and forth, we thought, I think is a better idea for this uh, building other than having a five foot planter in the front and then a five foot sidewalk. So we're asking the board to take that into consideration. Uh, we just feel it's a better look for the actual building with the larger sidewalk. The other item that we're asking the board to consider is um, the, t the light poles within the existing parking lot are all, um, I believe they're all 30 foot high where the board requires 20 foot high poles. We're asking the board to allow us, I believe we're only installing one more pole on the entire site. Uh, we're asking the board to allow us to keep that last pole going in as a 30 foot high pole. So there's consistency across the, the site itself. Um, the rest of the comments that we received, um, basically from um, the traffic and from, the, uh, from Woodard and Curran, our items, uh, technical things to put onto the plans to uh, have final documents to be able to give to the board. So uh, with that, I'll open up to the board for any questions. I'll, st I'll start with a quick one, the electric pull box. So the electric pull box is a flush mounted box. The transformer itself is to the uh, east of the site and then it goes on the ground and then the pull box is something that's flush mounted and so it's not really something that's going to be a visible transformer. So we're not really quite sure of why staff thinks that that would be something visible because it's actually something that's flush mounted. Um, so uh, what we would uh, request the board, the electrical line starts along um, on the outside of the site and then runs to the back of the, the building so that we can have the power at the back of the building. So that's a flush mounted, flush mounted uh, item and that allows us to get the power to the back of the building where it should be. Uh, where staff had talked about taking that, we'd actually end up going into the side of the building where we have some of that loading operations in some of the sidewalks, which would be more in the way I think of pedestrians walking around. So um, where it's flush with the ground, we felt that um, it's really in a good location where it is. Thank you, Rick. All right, since um, you would like it? this is an opportunity for public comment, um, is there anyone here that would like to make a comment prior to board discussion? Doug Richardson, Waterstone uh, Properties Group. Just to jump back to the vault, um, Central Main Power requires them so many feet from the transformer, that's why we have to do it. It is the vault that's sitting above ground right now. There is another pair of them that have been already installed on the Bob side, so you can see they are flush and, and invisible uh, from the ground they have a manhole to access. So you would not see it if it's in that place. And it's currently the same type uh, over in front of the Bob's discount furniture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Public comment. Is there anyone here to comment? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, Roger, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um, all right. First of all, 
is um, when you refer to the back of the building, is that the the side of the building by the um, boulevard? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, first the uh, note from Bill Bray regarding the uh, lot seven. Is that? I'm not sure I, I have that correct. So, so one of the things, storage, yeah. yeah. So one of the things that um, was discussed on our first plan set, we showed snow storage near the actual driveway coming in, and because we removed the large portion of that whole easterly part of the westerly part of the site is now no longer any parking at all. We're showing a large store storage area on that that westerly part, and I believe what he's asking us to do is put a note onto the plan that says that. Um, the snow is not allowed to be within the area. Um, I don't think he had a problem with where we're showing it. He just wants a note saying it's not allowed to go in the, you know, near the driveway entrances, okay, okay. which we're okay with doing. So that's where it is right up there? That's correct. Okay. Um, the only other question I have is on your landscaping. You're not proposing to have any landscaping on the front of the building then, is that correct? That's correct. It's a large sidewalk instead. Okay. Front, front facing the parking lot, right? Right, yeah. Front yeah. facing the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Robin? Um, so I just want to make sure that, that you're planning to work with staff on the, the stormwater aspects appropriately. So you've received the watered and current comments? We did, and, and there's some from your town staff, yeah. and a lot of those are, are just uh, clean up type of things. And I think we'll have our DEP permit uh, probably this week and should be able to address the other ones with staff. Okay, but just, just to clarify, you're gonna work on time of concentration and peak flow calculations with staff, that's yes. that's appropriate? Yep. Okay, and then you understand the difference between the post-construction inspection versus the active construction inspections that? We do, okay. and, and it's one of those things that we've, we've spent a lot of time out there making sure things are clean, yep. even before the, the site walk, to make sure that everything is, is tidy, and we will, because our five-year is hasn't happened yet it's coming up um okay. in like almost in the fall yeah so we've already worked starting with dp to set up the timeline to for make the sure recertification we fall. yep great excellent and then one of the last things is um an increase is shown in the post de development condition at analysis point number one in the hydrocad you're working through that with that, uh, yeah that's already been addressed but um, we'll make sure that that's pointed out to the staff um okay. in the documentation we have and I think that's pretty much all I had as long as staff is satisfied and um, you've you've talked about the the flooding in the area and that's been taken into account yep good thank you thank you Robin Rachel yeah I just have a question on the light pole so there's there's one that to be built that you would like to do to 30 feet I uh, you talk a little bit about the abutters they have the same 30 feet I'm not exactly sure. We didn't go out and search around, but this whole entire development with the big parking lot coming at it, it that's all 30. And actually, some of the poles that already exist are on our side of the, dr the access drive in the middle anyways. So to have 120, it would look kind of awkward in the whole entire development. Yeah, I, so. I, I'm, I'm in favor of the consistency. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the light poles on this property that were 30, but that rather throughout the whole development. I've worked on the project since the beginning, and all of the Lot 7, which did get constructed years after the Walmart and the Lowe's, we ensured that we used the exact spec from the planned unit development and that we were consistent, so this would be consistent with the other ones that are there. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm too generally satisfied as long as you continue to work with staff on uh, tying up the rest of these items. So. Okay. Uh, that said, I have a motion here. I uh, move to approve the project titled 700 Gallery Boulevard, proposed by Waterstone Properties Group, Inc., as depicted on the plan set prepared by Jones and Beach Engineers, dated 43018, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. The applicant is proposing to construct 8,242 square foot retail building with associated parking, landscaping, and stormwater management infrastructure. The property is located within the regional business. B2 district and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R37, lot 3307.
Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, and turnout, vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one, permit, uh, permit the proposed 10-foot wide sidewalk rather than the town standard of five feet of landscaping and five feet walkway. Conditions, there are three. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include the stormwater management plans and details per staff comments memo and a detail of the proposed dumpster enclosure that shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide a revised main DEP permit to the planning department. And number three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. And is the motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Robin. Any discussion on this topic? Uh, Nick, just to clarify that 1B has been removed. It has been removed. Thank you. Staff uh, seems generally comfortable with the explanation they were given and didn't realize it was false. Right. And were we going to put in the, th uh, the waiver on the 30-foot light as opposed to the 20-foot? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So I think with it being part of the application packet, then the board's approval, and that's in the documentation, that then the board's approval will sort of that's just a condition, that's just part and parcel of what the board's approving. Um, you're not waiving, you, they're allowed to go higher, so it's not as though you're, you know, it's not like it says, uh, again, sort of like with the 50 foot setback, they're asking for something different, it's just, okay, the starting point is 20, but mm -hmm. you can go higher with discussion, so. Okay. It's not necessarily a waiver, if I explained that well, I'm not sure, I don't feel like I did, but hopefully I got you there. <laughs> Any other discussion on this? All in favor? I'm sure that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much guys. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Mr. Chairman? Yes. The app, we're scheduled to be last, but the applicants before us are waiting for their architect. Can we switch? Uh, I would. I would be uh, okay with accepting a motion from a board member here to revise the agenda to switch Blue Belt, Bluebird Self Storage and Ashley and Alexander Holdings. Um, so moved to Second. take item number 13 ahead of item number 12. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor of flipping. Sure that is unanimous. Absolutely. So next on the list will be Ashley and Alexander Holdings LLC. Request a site plan review for 690 U.S. Route 1 Assessor's Map U30, Lot 12. Jamel. I'm going to do a, 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 an overview. Uh, certainly receive staff and peer review comments that dive into a number of the details, but um, I think in this application, sort of thinking about um, really there's sort of a, a bigger picture element here and um, um, in terms of access management and uh, particularly access to Route 1. As the board, you know, we actually went through a similar application with, with Prompto. It took a lot of iterations to try to find the right answer. Route 1 presents a number of challenges. Um, and it presents different challenges and different stretches of the road. Um, right here in front of Route 1, we sort of have a five-lane highway with a dedicated left-hand turn. In other stretches, there's, um, there's uh, barriers that might prohibit left-hand turns. In the stretch of Route 1 that we're talking about now, this is really from Old Blue Point um, Road set, uh, southerly towards Saco. Um, you know, in this stretch, it's, there's only four lanes of highway with limited right-of-way to work with. And there's, this is a, an area of, of uh, the town in a stretch of Route 1 where there's a series of small lots that have 50 to 75 feet of frontages with non-conforming single-family homes, grandfathered, non-conforming, all perfectly legal to be there now. But redevelopment presents certain challenges. And so this application is really the first redevelopment opportunity in this area of town. Um, and in a lot of ways, it, it presents great opportunity for revitalization in, 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 um, in the area. But I think the board, the town, and the applicant uh, 
we need to be mindful and cautious of ensuring that we're thinking of the long-term uh, development potentials. As I noted, this stretch of road is very difficult to consider how left-hand turn access from Route 1 either coming into or leaving the site um, would be challenged. And, and we don't really have a long-term vision for what the future of this area would be. I should mention that there is an RFP going out on the street pretty soon with our partners at PAX, the area, uh, the, the Portland area transportation folks, to actually start to think about Route 1 more comprehensively. Um, so that's one of the challenges that's presented with this application, but we think there are opportunities for short-term solutions um, that, that won't impact, have sort of adverse impacts in the long term. Um, the applicant has done a good job of sort of pulling together a number of properties and has access, uh, <coughs> potential access out to Old Blue Point Road. I know the traffic engineers are still working on numbers to see if that actually makes sense. We don't want to say that Old Blue Point Road is the definitive answer, but our ordinances typically say, look, where you have access on to two access points, you should really look to go to the secondary road first um, because it's really where turning movements occur, that's where accidents occur, that's where traffic problems occur. So we, we feel like there's some more information uh, to be gained and understood before we come to a definitive answer. And actually just, I think it was Friday, we had a very comprehensive meeting here in, in this room with the applicant, their design team, traffic engineer, representative from DOT, Town's peer reviewer, Bill Bray, staff sitting here at the table along with uh, Jim Butler, our commercial code fire inspector, to talk about this very issue. Um, so I think tonight, really, the board should think about this uh, discussion as really an elevated sketch plan review. Just a good opportunity to talk about any other challenges, <laughs> let the applicant know, you know what you're pleased with you're seeing, what other uh, areas uh, might need additional work, because I know they're interested to start development as soon as possible. Um, so uh, I guess just by way of quick background, as Jamel would typically do, this is in the TVC3 district. They're seeking a 10,000 square foot building that would have, I believe, upwards of four tenants. We're <coughs> talking currently of two restaurants and two personal service um, tenant spaces. Uh, again, as I mentioned at the outset, you received staff and peer review comments that laid out a number of things, but I just wanted echo a few of them, uh, just being mindful of buffering. Again, we uh, talked about there being a number of single family homes in the area, and sort of being mindful of redevelopment may happen in time, but it, currently those are single family homes. So what's the right treatment to, to be mindful of the, the, char uh, the, the character of the, the area? Um, I think thinking about the stormwater analysis and, and, and points of discharge and being sure that you know we're thinking about sort of long-term impacts. And then the only other thing would be worth talking about, well, not the only thing, the only other thing I'm gonna bring up before I turn it over <laughs> is just to be sure um, we're, when we think about the uh, parking capacity, um, we just didn't see in the application, um, want to be sure that when they're thinking about seating for the restaurants, I know there's some discussion about patio seating and how that's being folded in and articulated as part of their overall parking needs. Um, so I'm sure there's plenty of more interesting things to talk about, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Jay. And if the applicant would like to introduce themselves and this project to us, please. Chairman McGee, <clears throat> members of the planning board, my name is George Kerr. Um, I live in Old Orchard Beach, but most of, both of my daughters that are doing this project uh, live here in Scarborough. Uh, Ashley is out of the country right now uh, on business, so I'm going to take a stab at trying to uh, present what uh, she has indicated to me earlier tonight on the phone. First of all, I, I couldn't start this meeting off without uh, thanking the staff. Uh, I know they don't get complimented a lot, but... Uh, uh, Jamal, Angela, and Jim Butler during our meetings have been very, very helpful. Bill Bray, um, got to know him a little bit. Pretty uh, precise on being a traffic consultant uh, for the community and uh, people from DOT. Also, um, Jay Chase, 
taking the time and the energy dealing with uh, me over the past three years on this project to get the very best that we could provide because I do believe this is going to be the area that's going to be most revitalized uh, to comply with your ordinance um, to serve the village center and also the local market. As Jay has indicated, uh, things, it's very time sensitive. We have all of our tenants locked in. We're uh, uh, privileged to work with everybody within the community. And uh, I'm going to start off, I just would like to address a few of the issues. Then I'm going to lean to uh, Andy Highland from Port City Architects to do a little bit of design, show you the design and the materials that are going to be used. And then Will from Sebago Tech will give a more detailed look at some of Jamal's uh, questions so we can respond to them. Traffic is a major issue. I walked into this thinking I could solve the problem from Sauco to Dudson Corner. That didn't work out well. Money badly spent. Uh, we are doing traffic counts currently. Those numbers should be in uh, within the next day or two. I'll let Will respond to that. I think that uh, for the short term, and when I'm saying short term, uh, to get the project off the ground and comply with the ordinance, but I do believe that we still have to look at the old Blue Point traffic uh, light there, and I do know that uh, I would have to contribute to that. I have no problem doing that. Uh, again, I feel very comfortable with this area of Scarborough. I think it's an opportunity to really revitalize that area, and I want to play a major role in that. Uh, to address some of Jamal's issues, and I'll be very, very brief, uh, dealing on the front page uh, under uh, site access uh, is, I think Jay gave a pretty good summary of what uh, Bill Bray uh, wants us to do by using the old Blue Point Road. We don't have a problem with that. As again, as far as our participation with the light on old Blue Point Road, we're a player in the community. We expect to pay for that also or share in that cost. Uh, parking areas, I think that we discussed this. Um, I know my daughter hit on it the last time she was here dealing with uh, the five foot walkways. We want a clean and chic area so it's easily maintained. We have indicated, and I believe the plan will show that we have recommended that, and I hope you're flexible, to have potted plants. Because in the spring and the summers, that's when we're, it's good, they're going to be there. We don't want something that uh, you can't maintain during the winter. Um, under the pedestrians way, alternative transportation, truly I've heard a lot about sidewalks tonight. Speaking of sidewalks from nowhere, <laughs> this is it. Uh, but again, we are willing and able and want to uh, contribute to the fund uh, for sidewalks somewhere. Uh, hopefully, in the long term, uh, when DOT and everybody can address the traffic issues, uh, we can work should there be a sidewalk out in front, but I think that uh, that'll be years down the road. Uh, the other issue um, that was discussed under landscaping, um, my abutter, Michelle uh, Raper, who has State Farm Insurance, would like me, I, speaking, in speaking to her, she would like me to wait on any uh, buffers or anything like that because she kind of likes things the way they are. I will be meeting with her again. We've had meetings, very, a lot of meetings over the past three years, and uh, I just want to make sure whatever we recommend to you comes from her first. Uh, we've got a great relationship, and uh, as far as on the other side, I believe there's a, a fence and some bushes and whatever else we've got to do, we can work with, with the town or the abutter. Uh, under the last sentence here, the applicant is strongly encouraged to replace the proposed concrete block retaining wall with an element that complements design uh, to the main structure. Uh, that that is not exposed that wall. So I, I think on the plan that that issue wouldn't, that would not be an issue. Also, um, 
the last point just above lighting, the board should consider the installation of a wooden guardrail or other agreed upon feature along the back edge of the parking area to ensure snow storage does not occur within the proposed under drain soil filters. What I would, I, I have no problem and uh, with the guardrail fence, we've already indicated that on the southerly side uh, that abuts State Farm. But what I'd like to be able to do is, there's probably, I don't know exactly, I think Will will be able to tell you, 40 or 50 feet between uh, what is the parking area and the drainage ponds. I'd like to be able to move that further back, maybe 10 feet or 15 feet away from the ponds and be able to put snow there because that would be the long run and I don't think that would affect anything. Um, and the other issue, uh, outdoor storage. Uh, I intend on putting in cedar fencing, natural cedar fencing, so everything is conducive. Uh, that would be behind the building and along to block the, uh, the electric boxes. Um, and I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, but again, I, I just want to thank uh, the staff. Uh, they've done a great job. I've served on plenty of boards, and uh, uh, they do a good job. And I appreciate them taking the time to help us expedite this. I think the input is good. We have some disagreements, but hopefully at the next meeting we can iron those things out. At uh, this time, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, Andy Highland from Port City Architects to give you a look at what we're proposing to build, the style and materials that are going to be used. If you have any questions, I have no problem answering them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, uh, good evening. As uh, George said, I'm Andy Highland at Port City Architecture. We're the architects for the project. So I just wanted to really briefly kind of go over materials, the kind of building uh, basic data. It's, uh, as you can see up here, it's a one-story uh, uh, trust roof wood construction building. And uh, it is a, a pitched roof on the top. And uh, we are looking to uh, just put four tenants in, kind of side by side on the front. It's about 10,000 square feet, so I think it's about 80 by 125 is the footprint of the building. We've got a 10-foot arcade in the front here. We're looking to put the restaurants on each end, so one of the restaurants would be on this side, and uh, the other restaurant would be on the other side here. And, I, and we've located uh, on the ends, rather than in the front, some kind of seasonal outdoor seating. And right now we're proposing, uh, it's almost like 400 square feet, maybe like a 20 by 40, something like that, uh, but that can vary on the sides. So I think that's kind of always a nice piece when you see uh, and, and located on the side, I think it'll be a little more comfortable than being right in the front of the building itself. Uh, and um, so, uh, anyway, there's sidewalk that comes all the way around, and uh, and you know, so you can get access. And we're looking at access points uh, through from inside the restaurant as well to be in there. That's my. I'm sorry about that. Okay, all right. <laughs> Wasn't me. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay. There we go. I've got one. Anyway. I just won't touch anything. Okay, okay. I was like, yeah, I didn't touch anything. I was just standing here. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, so the other two, uh, uh, the other two tenants that they're looking at are personal services in the middle. One of the things we like to do, so uh, we're pretty traditional in our kind of looks and, and uh, kind of the main heritage. We also, on retail, uh, I like to, you know, incorporate the signage within the facade. So we've added the gables in the fronts and, and a wide enough area that you can actually, you know, we're not sticking signs on the roof or uh, anything like that, that they actually kind of become part of the architecture. And it'll be uh, similar in their, in their look. Other thing that we do uh, is also bring the front of the gable roof up a little bit higher. Uh, this everything will be heated and cooled with rooftop units, gas-fired rooftop units. So we kind of chisel out a little bit of the uh, back area, cover the front so that they'll all be uh, screened uh, from the street, and and then any kind of snow will just drain off the back of the building. Um, this is kind of just the whole site. I'll let Will 
kind of take a, a look at things uh, on the site plan itself. Uh, this is just our parking around and uh, route run uh, on the front. Um, materials we're looking at, if I just didn't get into that, so asphalt shingle roof, the uh, uh, siding and the trim will all be uh, cementitious, hardy plank and hardy trim siding. And we're looking at a base, about a three or four foot base of uh, stone uh, veneer on the bottom as well. So that's pretty much uh, the architecture uh, with it. And I'll be, I'll uh, introduce Will now, who you know, Will Conway from Sebago Technics, and he'll uh, talk to you about all the uh, hot and burning site issues uh, for the, and traffic for the project. Okay. Thank you. Solve the technology. Thank you, Andy. Um, good to be back. Uh, it's not too late. So, and I know there's another applicant. So, I'm not going to be so brief. So, my apologies for that. But I, I try to be concise. Um, we had a great meeting on Friday with Jay, Jamel, Angela, your town engineer, and MDOT. And um, I think what you're going to see uh, when we come back is. Um, I can refer to the site plan, is we'll have a driveway connection here to Old Blue Point Road, which will be full access in and out. And then for Route 1, the only movement that will be allowed is a right turn in only. So there will not be allowed any exiting traffic onto Route 1. As Jay said in his introduction, we don't know that that's how it's going to play out, but I'm trying to give you an idea that that's probably the way that it's trending. And as George mentioned, we're currently doing counts on the light at Old Blue Point Road, and there'll probably be some work required there that George is uh, willing to uh, contribute with. So after that meeting on Friday, Jamel and I tossed the idea of tabling this meeting tonight. And we didn't want to do that because, um, as George mentioned, he's got his tenants ready to go. Uh, we have our DEP permit that's been under review. Uh, we have, we think, a pretty reasonable time frame to conclude the traffic uh, solution. So we'd like to be back before you one more time uh, with our DEP permit and DOT permit in hand. And so what I wanted to do is to use tonight's meeting to hammer out all the other details which are important mm -hmm. that don't relate to traffic um, and um, there are some overlap with stormwater. But, so I'm going to go through some details here. Um, to answer Jay's question, um, the proposed patio seating is included in the uh, off street parking requirements. And neither restaurant plan on any uh, customer standing or waiting areas. George mentioned this, we're uh, happy to contribute to the Route 1 sidewalk. And again, I'm not to, for your purposes and Jamel's, I'm not going to go through every item in his memo. I'm just going to go through the ones that I think require uh, the board's input. Um, I don't understand the, the request on page 2. Uh, to provide directional signage markers shall be utilized in diagonal parking lot arrangements. Directional markers shall be added to the one-way portions. And that's referring to this area here, which is this is one-way traffic coming in this direction. Right here we have a sign that says do not enter. So beyond that, I don't know, are you talking about pavement striping or, or arrows on the pavement? I, I don't know. We'll do whatever you want. I just don't know what it is. There's or what the board would look for us to do. Yeah, he'll give you a quick answer on that. Go ahead. Pavement markers will be good. Okay. Okay. Is the board comfortable with that? If staff is. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll go down to the next slide. 
says there appears to be a conflict between proposed snow storage areas along the property frontage along Route 1 and proposed plannings. The applicant should be prepared to discuss this with the board. So what we're showing on Route 1, these are street trees, and then these are uh, hydrangeas and um, perennials in a shrub bed. And then this area right here is a lawn area. And then similar here, you've got a small amount of shrub beds and a lawn area here. We're showing the snow storage in the lawn areas and not in the planting beds. And we did that on purpose. I don't think we want to propose snow storage in planting beds, but typically a lawn area, in my opinion, is an adequate location for that purpose. Any other items you want to point out? Should I just go through and then yeah, you can take them up at, at one time? Okay, we'll do it that way. Um, George mentioned uh, the uh, requested waiver or relief from the five foot <coughs> landscape strips along the uh, sidewalks in the buildings. So we have, as Andy showed, we have a, uh, a covered canopy in this location here that would prevent that. And in these areas here, we have the patios. And what I was surprised to see this in the comments again, because Ashley, when she was here at the uh, sketch plan presentation, presented her idea or vision to use planters in those areas instead of a, uh, an actual landscape strip. And we all thought that the board was on board with that. But that's uh, something I'd like to hear from when I, when I conclude. Um, there was a request to provide a traffic calming device at this crosswalk, uh, which is no longer really relevant because the sidewalk, <coughs> we don't know where it's going to be built. We're providing an in-lieu fee for it. So we don't know where a sidewalk would, would connect or where it would be. So I don't think that requirement or request to provide a raised crosswalk is applicable with the sidewalk going away on Route 1. Um, the other comment was right here, was the request was to replace this concrete block retaining wall with an element that complements the design of the main structure. So George mentioned to it, it it's something that you're not going to see. Um, and it's, it's very low in profile, and it's a it's not cinder blocks. It will be a decorative, you know, you've seen them around uh, like a split face stone kind of appearance. And so we're proposing to leave that as we had originally submitted. And the other thing, let's see. Boy, that's hard to see. But I'll try to explain it. So um, the comments uh, asked for, so what we proposed in, in this area, in this area, and around the dumpsters, these two are exterior storage areas for assorted uh, materials to support the restaurants, um, recyclables, um, deliveries, et cetera, that would be stored outside at certain times of the year. And then the uh, enclosure around the dumpster, we proposed it as chain link with vinyl slats. And we saw Jamel's comment, and we thought it made sense. And so what we're proposing to do is to change all of those from chain link to a decorative uh, cedar fence, six feet high with a nice lattice uh, on the top to give the, the fence some detail. And to also, this is the part that's hard to see, but I think you can visualize. The transformer is located here, uh, not in the, um, the 15 by 15 foot area, but it's adjacent to it. So what we would do is extend the um, cedar fence down so the transformer would be, would be behind it. And so it wouldn't be visible from 
this area uh, of the project, and we think that's an improvement uh, to the project. And the last item uh, I'll mention is the uh, request to propose uh, a wooden guardrail here in this location so that snow is not deposited in the ponds. So we need some area right here adjacent to the pavement. It's more like uh, 20 feet, George. Um, that, but it would be a physical barrier here so that snow would not be pushed into the ponds themselves. So I will include that, uh, conclude there, and ask for uh, feedback on the items I request. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have public comment on this item tonight. Is there anyone here from the public that wishes to speak relating to this item? If you could just provide your name and address for the record, please. My name is Scott Barubia. I live at 684 US Route 1, resident for 10 years, deep contributor to the community. Um, and my property abuts this property. And we are talking about three sides of my property being affected by this project. This is where I live. You can share this with the people. If you could do me a favor and try to just hold it up at the podium um, rather than trying to do your explanation for so, everyone here to um, see. I don't object to a project. Uh, first, I want to thank the DEP and the DOT for letting me know about it. I'm deeply disappointed in Jay, Jamel, and Angela for not including me in Friday's meeting or telling me about it, especially since I went to the DOT meeting and expressed my concerns verbally, in person, and in writing. I don't object to the project. George has been nice enough to let me know about it, but I do object to the project the way it's set. Um, my first biggest objection is the entryway. Whether it's right turn, exit, entry only or not, that is very close to my bedroom windows. So my properties you see in that picture, the, I have four bedroom windows that are four feet from the property line. Okay? Four feet. Vroom! That's the sound of a Harley Davidson at 8.30 at night taking off multiple times at a restaurant. Beep, beep, beep. That's the sound of a plow at 3.30 in the morning in the winter doing its duty to clear that up before businesses have to open. That's my property right next door. I object to two restaurants on this project. I wish I had been given an opportunity, Jay, to speak up earlier, but I hadn't and I didn't even know about it. And I've been told that you guys are driving the two restaurants. So I'm asking the planning board tonight to please reconsider this project, to scale it back to one restaurant. Reason being, if we scale back to one restaurant, you don't need 85 parking spaces, which covers almost all of this territory with impervious surface. Okay, right now the neighbor just two years ago stripped all the land next to mine and I already have flash fl flooding in my backyard where before I had none. The other concerns I have is noise pollution, light pollution, and um, air pollution. <coughs> Diesel trucks starting and stopping. That's 300 starts and stops a day next to my windows where before there were none. I ask the planning board to please have these people go back, reassess two restaurants. My first concern, I will repeat, is the entryway. I am requesting that the entryway be put at the southernmost part of the property, which shouldn't be a very hard thing to do. We don't need cars exiting and entering four to seven feet from my window. I have the right to breathe fresh air in July and keep my windows open just like you people do. Jibber, jibber, jibber. That's the cigarette smoke coming from the patio next to my bedroom windows at 8.30 on a Friday night after I've given to this community all I have and I'm trying to get some sleep on a Friday night. You can tell I'm passionate about this because no one came and asked for my input to put an outside restaurant patio right next to my bedroom windows. They didn't ask me about the 40 parking spaces that would go right next to my bedroom windows and my back window. They didn't ask me about the revolving traffic around the five or seven properties that exist right now 
in that area. No one came to me and asked, hey, Scott might have had a good idea. Put the entry at the southern end. Move the building over a little. Cut down on the parking spaces. Build a buffer. Let's not have an outdoor patio on that side next to the residence. That's what I'm asking you. Three things. One, move the entry down to the southern end. Two, no outside patio. Actually, two, only one restaurant instead of two, and certainly not the patio that's included. And, um, and three, to move the building so that the entryway can be at the southern part. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work that's already been done. A lot of people are excited, except for me and my neighbors. No, none of us are excited about this. There's um, planning board members, just so you know, there's already five restaurants in the immediate area, and there's a huge one going across the street. On top of the five plus one, there's two food service places already existing, Pine Tree Food and Lobster Shack. We don't need two restaurants in this project. I'll take one. Don't forget about the greasy smokestack smell that I have to smell all every night through my open windows from now until September. I have the right to breathe fresh air, to have peace, and to, have, to be able to live next to a neighbor in good standing. All of our neighbors, you wouldn't even know we existed. There's no loud noises, there's no emissions, there's no lighting. We are very, very good residents of this town. So I'm asking you one more time, and I very much thank you for this opportunity that move that entry to the southern end do not have the circulating traffic. If you only have one restaurant, you don't need circulating traffic. The only thing driving all the negatives of this whole thing is the two restaurants. We don't need it. So um, that being said, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Is there any other public comment this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment section. And who would like this one first? Let's go with... Oh, sure. Robin. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I guess I'll start with the project first. So, um, Will, can you remind me, or, or George, can you remind us where snow storage, you want to put it in the front on the lawn? Um, Correct. Yeah, there's an area here along the side, an okay. area here, an area here. Okay. Uh, no, you know, you want it nowhere near your, your stormwater infrastructure. Otherwise, it's, you're going to pay the cost in long term, in, in annual maintenance <coughs> of the four bay and what you have there kind of a thing. So I would rethink putting it there, but thank you for putting a guardrail or some other um, traffic um, protection uh, system in. That's really important. Um, I, I think as far as um, uh, Mr. Baruby's concerns, um, it looks like the building is already as far away from his, his, par his parcel as possible. Um, I don't know, maybe you could put some more trees or something the along the side. It's the Excuse me. The Excuse me. Public side. comment is over. Thank you. So, the, the other thing, the other, the other, the other thing, is sir, you're out of order. Sir. Will? The other thing the board should be aware of is there's a six foot stockade fence currently along Mr. Berube's entire property line. Right. Yeah. And Along Route One, there's a there's a mature <coughs> row of arborvitae trees. That's right. That further buffer his property. Okay, and I, I just want to say thank you so much for talking with the, the landowner to give Old Point Road access. I know when you were in before, we sort of planted the idea, and you didn't really want to, but I think that's 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 huge. You guys have done a tremendous amount, and I also appreciate you giving the staff the kudos that they deserve for, for working with you all. And I, and um, as much as I understand Mr. Barubi's passion and frustration, um, I, think it's, I think it's something that um, we all need to, to think about who our neighbors are kind of a thing. Um, I've been a resident of Scarborough now for 20 years. I rented for 10 years before I purchased a place. 
and living on Route 1, unfortunately, you're, you're going to get the Harleys going up and down Route 1 regardless of... So anyway, Will, thank you so much for, for continuing to work. And I know it's probably, is it Paul who's working with them? Or are you part of this project team too? I saw Paul Ostrowski's name he's on the, He's things. the stamping engineer. Okay. I'm the project manager. So can you answer some stormwater questions for me? I can try. I okay. know what watershed. <laughs> All right. What watershed are we in? All right, I'll give you the meatball first. I think I saw that. Scarborough River, right? Yeah. Should be to this Okay. Uh... What are, what are the stormwater issues here? Um, the only issue I'm aware of is that we are having trouble meeting the peak uh, out in this area here. But we, I spoke to Paul this afternoon. Can you show me the area one more time, Will? Sorry. Right here. Okay. Yep. Out here. Because mm -hmm. the land kind of breaks. Most of it's coming this way, but there's a little bit of towards Route 1. We are having trouble meeting that study point. Okay. But we... Uh, we can uh, adjust the grading to make that happen so that um, we, I glossed over the stormwater comments other than this issue okay. about the protection of the pond because we're comfortable we can meet all of those comments that, that uh, Woodard, Carmen, and Great. Angela have made. Too. And can you just remind me, are you doing uh, curb and gutter at all or is it all sort of like sheet flow? You're not doing any catch basins? Yes, we are. To, you are going yeah, to? Yeah, it's okay. all, it's all uh, catch okay. basins. So directed. you could potentially regrade to a catch basin and, yes. and put it to where it needs to go. So I encourage you to, to do that, to, to make sure you dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Um, yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, the five-foot landscape strip, I know you had a question on that, Will, and I know that Ashley had said, what about plants and the like kind of a thing. So <coughs> I'm not going to address that because I know that other board members will. Um, uh, replacing the retaining wall, I know that you mentioned that, one of those things too. Um, is there's there's just to be sure, there's no retaining wall there now. It, it would be something right. that you've proposed due to the dif difference in elevation between the abutter. Yeah, there's a low point right there. Okay, and so is that the state farm that's yeah, on that side? It okay. is. Okay, and you're working with the abutter to make sure that the facade is appropriate for, for both. Um, to me, I think that is, that is super important, is dealing with the person who has to look at it the most kind of a thing. So thank you for, for doing that. And if there is any other way that we can buffer Mr. Barubi's property, whether it's with, with uh, Arborvitae and the, and the like, that would, be, that would be very much appreciated. And I, I think that's, that's about all I have, but thank you so much for the progress that you have done so far. Thank you for your approach um, in, in working with the town. And I will pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Rachel, would you like to come back? Yeah. Um, one of your questions was around the planters on the outside patio, and I do recall the discussion, uh, and I had no problems with the planters, and I don't recall that anybody else did, but folks can speak for themselves. I, I do know that one question I had was, what's the, like, what's the spacing of the sidewalk outside of those patio areas? Are people going to be able to, to walk down and yes. round, is that going to be wide enough? Yeah, so looking at the screen, and it's mirrored on either side. Yeah. So we're going to have a nice, low, like three foot tall, uh, black picket metal fence so that you uh, exit the restaurant into an uh, enclosed space. Mm -hmm. And then the sidewalk, if you were parked here, you would walk around it, on the, at, around the outside of it, to the entries. And there's enough, what's there's the width? Six feet wide. Six feet, okay, good. So that's quite... Um, I, it, would it be possible, I, I heard Mr. Barubi's concern about uh, smoking out on the patio, would it be possible uh, to ask the patrons not to smoke we'll consider out on that patio? We, we need to talk to our tenants, but we'll yeah, consider. Yeah, I, I, I understand, we but it, it, it would be, we'll that, would be uh, that would be helpful, I think. Um, what are the hours of operation? Because I also heard a concern about early and late and hours and... I, I, I understand this really point. isn't you know, part of it, but I, we do need to so think about it. It's an absolute valid question, uh, Rachel. 
Uh, I believe they'll probably be open or starting their businesses somewhere around 10, 10.30. They will not be serving breakfast, and that's one of the issues I think that uh, Maine DOT had with the traffic. There will be no morning traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assume that they'll probably stay open until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. These are family establishments. And uh, as far as the smoking and stuff, uh, I can't commit to that. My tenants are all lined up. I can make a suggestion. Uh, one of the tenants has been my tenant for 20-something years. He's got 10 different locations in the state of Maine. And uh, I, will, I will do my best. I'm a non-smoker. I understand that. And uh, I don't know exactly uh, how far it is to uh, uh, Mr. Ruby's house from where our building is in the patio. That's why I bought uh, Mr. Purvis's property so that I could increase that buffer. Uh, but again, I have no problem. I, I did make sure that Mr. Ruby knew that uh, the project's coming forward. It hasn't been a secret. We've been working uh, for about three years on it, and I'll be more than willing to sit. Sir. And I'll be more than willing to uh, sit down with him or anybody else in the neighborhood uh, to resolve whatever, whatever issues they have. Uh, I'm a uniter, not a divider. Thank you very much. Okay. Comment on the smoking. It might be regulated that it's not allowed by the state of Maine. You can't smoke in a restaurant. Exactly. But yeah, can you smoke? Hey, I'm just wondering about the rules. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, a, I don't know what the rules are on, on the patio. We'll check. Not we'll if check you're, I don't believe you can if you're serving food. And the employees go up back and smoke on cigarette breaks. It permeates over the next property. Okay. Um, I have sir, a, sir, I do have. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say this once, Mr. Ruby. I would like to hear no more outbursts out of you. I would appreciate it if you continue to make these outbursts. I will ask you to leave the meeting. Thank you. Having had restaurants for 44 years, you're not allowed to smoke out in the patios, and you got to be 25 feet from a window. Okay, okay. that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I, and I, uh, I, I also want to want to say that I recall the discussion from. That, that we had initially, and um, at the time, and it's, that's continued, I'm very impressed with the commitment you folks have to, to improving the area of Scarborough uh, mm -hmm. and to, to really bringing a, uh, a building like this, a uh, facility like this. Thank you. Thank you. Roger. Um, sure. Um, at the last uh, meeting, last time you were here, I raised a question about the entrance. I was wondering why it wasn't in the middle versus where it's located. Considering now that you're going to be thinking about an entrance off of the old Blue Point Road, <coughs> is there, what's your thoughts about maybe moving that Route 1 entrance further south? We can't do it because the, uh, the nature of the, the grades are that it, it drops pretty uh, considerably. And for right here to right here is about a seven foot grade difference. And so we just can't make that work. So it really has to be about where we've got it. Just the way the, the grading of the site is and the grading in Route 1. Okay. Um, I, I assume also your, um, your parking plan that you have <coughs> presented to us will change slightly when you take into consideration coming in off of Old Blue Point Road. Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, it's going to affect this this opening right here. I don't think it, you'll see anything different in here or in here, but maybe right in this area. I could see some geometry changing there. What about buffering on the, uh, again, dealing with Old Blue Point Road, some sort of buffering to those properties, the three properties of private? Uh, we, I, I think he's referencing the back side of the... Yeah, the back Mr. Baruby and the other pro. Oh, you're talking setting. about this area here. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll certainly consider that. What's that Absolutely. now? Is it is it is it just grass or meadow? Yes. Or? There's trees. Right. Trees. Yeah, let me just. Roger, uh, I've taken into consideration what my neighbors want. I tried to develop it on this plan with the help of uh, Andy and uh, Will. Uh, as far as the road from DOT, that was kind of a, something that came up during our meetings. I will do whatever I can to address those issues. The other thing that is not shown on the plan 
is I'm probably going to have to have a sign. I own 200 feet on Old Blue Point Road. Yes. Okay. I'm probably going to have to have a sign because we're going to tr hopefully the traffic will be making a left or right out, out of the Old Blue Point Road. Okay. So yeah, right, uh, right in this area. Right in that area there. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that was part of the acquisitions that I've made. So the, what's the likelihood when you um, when you do put that road in that it's going to be right close by the existing residence? Or will it be more in the center of that? No, no, because uh, I've made no mystery of this. Uh, I do own a lot of property along Route 1. I intend on coming back in a year or so, uh, building another 10,000 square foot building on this property uh, for my daughter. Okay. Uh, as she had indicated to you, and I think that uh, SEDCO has worked with us. We do a lot of, uh, she does, uh, her design work is outside the country, and pe we want to invite people to come in rather than, she's got a major showroom at the Atlanta Mart. We'd like to bring those people here and do business and write orders. So uh, I don't want someone not to know what my intentions are. Uh, I've said this three years ago. Uh, the, and I owe quite a bit of property on Route 1 to the right of the old Blue Point Road, probably close to 1,500 feet, uh, all the way up to, but not including the corner of Church Street. So I'm, I'm here to stay. I'm here to make a change in that area. And uh, I hope to work with not only the boards, my neighbors, and uh, do the best possible job that we can do. Okay. Um. Just for my own benefit, um, in Bill Bray's document, he refers to a high turnover sit-down restaurant. What, what does that mean? People turn over like in an hour or something like that? or I, I, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Bray. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, you kind of listen and don't ask a whole lot of questions. I can't, I, 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 I don't know. I've had a restaurant. Uh, it's, I'm not a fast, I don't, these restaurants are not fast food. Okay. They're pretty elegant restaurants. So uh, I, if I could. Uh, yes, uh, yes, that, yes. The high turnover, that, that's a definition I believe coming out of the ITE, the Institute for Traffic Engineers uh, model um, or, or uh, a manual, I should say. Um, and so there's different type of restaurants. So it doesn't necessarily mean a you know a fast food restaurant or necessarily a chain restaurant. Um, That's I don't national know exactly data. What the That's national is, data that they use. Right. So. Um, and lastly, I, I assume there's going to have to be some sort of signage or something at the Route One or Blue Point Road. Yeah, I had indicate. Oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, go on, Roger. Yeah, I indicated. Because of the chain and the change in the site plan, uh, we would definitely have to have a, a, a sign on Route One, and I had said earlier on the old Blue Point Road. But it will be done in good taste. Okay. Um, this reminds me a little bit of the um, the Nonsuch Brewery. It, this is a TBC zone where there's residential properties close by, and you know, a mixed use commercial residential zone. I'm all set. Thank you, Brad. Um, so I think you know, my colleagues have covered quite a bit of distance here on this. Um, I'd ask planning um, staff whether or not they feel like they've had either all, most of their questions answered at this point or have any remaining outstanding items that they feel they need guidance from the planning board on. I think I'm okay. Seems like we've touched on the big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's still more information to be gathered on traffic and what that ultimate design looks like, but I think we touched on the big ones. And, um, so, uh, yeah, with that said, knowing that there's an alternate plan that's probably going to be developed once your traffic numbers come in, um, you know, I'll reserve any of the further questions I have considering the extent to which the rest of this board has already covered most of it. So, um, that said, I think we're all looking forward to seeing what that traffic numbers indicate um, and seeing what that next next design plan looks like. I would encourage you to work with your abutters um, just to make sure that um, they are getting you know, a good amount of buffering, um, that you, you attempt to satisfy um, 
you know, as many concerns as you reasonably can, uh, considering, you know, that you are in a commercial district here, and uh, but there's nothing wrong with being good neighbors. So, um, Chairman McGee, I will meet with the abutters again uh, and see whatever other issues that I can resolve, uh, and I'll report back to to uh, Jamal and Jay and Angela. And the other thing is that I know, I have a sense of what's going to come out of the. Department of Transportation and the work that we're going to have to do. So that's why I, I did say about the light that I think is going to be have to be a signal there. And I know that I'm going to have to uh, be responsible for a portion of that, probably a, do a third, a third with the town, a third with the uh, Department of Transportation, or maybe there's some grants that are available. But I will be looking into that and uh, moving forward along those lines. But this isn't just for my project. I, I think it's an exciting time for the town of Scarborough. This area is going to be developed, uh, and I hope to be a play a part in that. But I do also believe we've got to address the traffic on Route 1 for the long term. And I want to work with everybody to do that so that we can prosper like every other community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nick? Yes. Um, I, Mr. Berube, if I heard him correctly, he alluded to the fact that um, he, he said the planning board or the planning department drove the two restaurants. That's what I heard as well. Yeah. I think that should be clarified. Um, no, that was the applicant's proposal. The planning board did not drive that. Okay. So I think it's important to have the actual facts out there. Yeah, that's a, that was a applicant-driven decision. Okay. Thank you for clarifying and thank you for correcting that, Roger. I appreciate it. Nick, I'd just like to ask the applicant if they feel like they've gotten all the information they need from the planning board in order for you to move forward with a concise plan. I Did think you so. You're good with the, five, with the planters. Well, and I, I would push that back to staff because, you know, I was the one, too, saying, oh, I'm good with that or what others, but also the, the facade for the stone wall, I know... You know, did I did I overstep as far as you know saying work with the abutter? Um, you know that kind of a thing. Okay, all right. I think we're good. Okay. Thanks. We'll see you in June. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Last item for the evening, number twelve, uh, thirteen. Bluebird Bluebird Self Storage requests a site plan review for a hundred Enterprise Drive. Assessor's map U39, lot 4701. Jamal, would you like to introduce this one? All right, thank you. Well, we got to them. Um, so this uh, proposal is located at 100 Enterprise Drive in the Highgus Parkway Zoning District. Um, it's, it's at the corner of Route 1 and Enterprise Drive, um, kind of a kitty corner there. Uh, the applicant's proposing a 103,524 square foot three-story condition self-storage facility on lot one in the approved Enterprise Business Park subdivision. As board members may remember, this site was subject to a recent zone change uh, with the town council that included the addition of this use uh, permitted within the Highgate Parkway zone. And also, this, um, this parcel was in to be included in the Highgate Parkway zone as part of that. During the zoning change process, uh, town council uh, requested significant buffering and landscaping along the lot's Route 1 frontage, so the board will want to make sure that this request is reflected in the site design. Any application for site plan review, uh, up for a site plan review in the Highgus Parkway zone, uh, requires a graphic representation of the site and building as seen from the public ways, um, so that would be Route 1 and Enterprise Drive. Um, so while the zoning ordinance does not uh, provide regulations for parking, the amount of parking spaces um, for this use, uh, the parking is to be determined by the planning board. Uh, so the applicant should be prepared to explain why the proposed amount of parking is adequate for this use. Uh, staff, you know, along with the uh, request for additional buffering, staff recommends that the fire lane and under drain soil filter uh, proposed along the southern edge of the building be modified in order to provide the required buffering um, along Route 1. Uh, staff would like to know that you know, we're a little confused as to why the existing electric overhead wires across the site are proposed to remain, as uh, the majority of Enterprise Business Park is primarily served with underground power. And staff recommends that the proposed recessed EIFs 
be redesigned to complement the proposed windows on the building and the building elevations. Um, and staff also recommends that the applicant provide samples of materials uh, to be used to ensure the materials are consistent with the town's design standards. And finally, um, you know, there's a host of staff comments. Um, additionally, uh, Woodard and Curran and Traffic Solutions have also provided some peer review comments about general engineering, stormwater, and traffic concerns. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome the applicant. Please uh, state your name. And uh, good evening. My name is Rick Lundborn. I'm the project engineer from Fuss and O'Neill. Uh, with me tonight is Bill Goodison from Bluebird Storage, uh, Cell Storage, to answer any questions about the facility, its operations, or uh, questions of that nature. Also, Brendan McNamara, the, the building designer, is uh, here as well to talk about the facade treatments and then the building itself. And uh, Stuart Mitchell, who will be overseeing the construction of a uh, project as well, is here talk about any kind of construction related questions that you folks might have if, if you do. I also have um, uh, renderings uh, to help satisfy some of the comments. Obviously, it's more just to help for the discussion this evening. I also have it digitally, so we can project it as well. So we're going to hand those out right now. <coughs> So as Jamel had summarized, the proposal is taking place on map Q39, lot 4701, 100 Enterprise Drive. Uh, it has been rezoned to the Haggis Parkway zone. Um, and currently, the lot is vacant, has about 3.79 acres. It's wooded, uh, has some lawn areas, and some wetland on it. Uh, Existing improvements, as Jamel noted, there's a power line easement that runs from US Route 1 all the way over to the uh, daycare facility. It's the first lot on the east in Enter Enterprise Drive. There's also an existing power line that runs through there. Um, you know, we'll work with CMP to remove that if it's unnecessary, but it looks to be going to another user, and that's why it's remaining. In we have to consult with them first uh, before we propose it being eliminated. Um, also, there is a bituminous sidewalk right now today that runs along Enterprise Drive, and it's inside of a construct uh, an easement for both stormwater and that sidewalk uh, along that side of the development. And it has water and sewer available on site and electrical we would be pulling from uh, the Route 1 side into, the, into a transformer pad located at the corner of the building. So we're proposing a, a three-story facility. Right now, um, Bluebird's operating in eight different locations, or this would be the first location in Maine, and they're looking to continue to expand in, in the southern Maine area. This building in particular has 35,088 square foot footprint and an overall uh, gross square footage for the building of 103,524 square feet over the three floors. Uh, it's an internal uh, storage facility, so there's no external storage at all. Everything is stored inside the building. Um, you know, obviously have internal lifts, elevators, um, and, and the like to get to the upper floors. There's about 650 storage units internal. And uh, all the lighting inside the building is on sensors, sort of like if you go to a Target and you walk through the uh, grocery aisles, the individual refrigerator lights are off until you walk down the aisle. That's how the lights inside this building operate. 
as you walk down the hallway to your unit, the lights turn on and turn off as you proceed down the hallway to help save energy. Uh, exterior lighting is all dark skies compliant, and uh, the building itself will be sprinklered, fire alarmed, have a Knox box and keypad entry system. Uh, obviously, they're storing people's goods. Um, it's climate controlled, so it has an alarm system and security cameras throughout the building and on property. Um, because everything is stored inside and it's a locked facility, there are no gates necessary, no fencing required. Again, there's not going to be any external storage. They don't allow tractor trailer deliveries. Um, it doesn't fit with what they're trying to accomplish. It, it tends to drive people to do things like get big lots of things and store them here. And that's not what they're trying to do. This is storage for folks like you or me that have things that they just want to have in, in a, a slightly nicer storage facility than just the old straight line wrinkle tin type uh, storage facilities that aren't uh, climate controlled. You know, you can get some property damage from storing in there if you're not, if it's not the right type of stuff. Um, so the hours of operation for this facility will be Monday through Friday, 6 to 8, Saturday, 6 to 6, and Sunday, 6 o'clock to 4. And it's staffed from 9 o'clock in the morning until the close of each business day. And that's all through the week, Saturdays and Sundays included. Um, this is generally a pretty uh, low impact type of a project for a community. Um, obviously there's no school, children living here, there's not generally a need for ambulance services. It's really just um, a police and fire service at worst, and generally that's not necessary either. It's pretty benign use. Um, we did get comments from Jamel and Jay and the staff, as well as Mr. Bray and Woodward and Kern. Um, and I can, I'll walk through some of that, but I'm not going to belabor the point with you folks on all of those things. Uh, right now we have, I'll just finish a round out of the site. The site does propose 31 parking spaces throughout um, and an additional two for box trucks that the facility will operate. Uh, one of the op uh, services that Bluebird offers its uh, customers is a pickup at your home or a location of your choosing and they'll come and bring the things you're storing here and typically they'll have trucks that they share between different facilities um, so they would park those in one of the two long box truck spaces off the back. Um, the proposal is to have some under drain soil filters. There's one here adjacent on the north side of the lot adjacent to um, where basically customers that are going into the office will park and the main driveway in. Um, it has a four bay on the other side of the uh, turnaround here that takes stormwater from the roof and two of the three catch basins in the back paved area and that is routed under that uh, turnaround area via two culverts. I'll show you that on uh, the grading and drainage plan. So these are basically hydraulically connected by two culvert pipes that have a larger capacity than the inlet pipe. Um, so as the water fills up that four bay it just goes through those pipes and keeps going into the um, under drain soil filter portion of that structure. The other side is really only taking about a third of the roof and one catch basin and it has a manhole in line preceding the catch basin before it goes to that other under drain soil filter. So the sediment removal needs aren't as high as for the other one where it's taking the bulk of the storm water from the back area. Um, Otherwise, we're proposing all the utilities to be underground. Again, transformer pad located off that corner, the southeast corner of the building. And um, also bringing, uh, proposing to have gas come in off of that corner of the building as well, phone and, and phone and cable service as well. Um, Water and sewer would come in off of the existing stubs on Enterprise Drive near the main driveway. 
So I'll briefly go through some of the comments and things from staff and the peer reviewers. Uh, there was a comment regarding, um, well, obviously the renderings that I just handed out, which are here. So this, this rendering would be looking at the corner of the building as you're driving back out Enterprise Drive towards Route 1. The blue car is headed towards Route 1. And um, this would be looking at it at the building from route one, across Route 1. As you're coming down, you can see where the signage would be located up on the right of way of the uh, slip ramp. So we will end up rolling that into <coughs> the uh, plan submissions in the future. And that will, again, like this, dep depict the proposed um, landscaping as to, to match what the landscape architect has developed. Um, with regards to the parking, the question regarding the number of parking spaces, this is not a, uh, what you would call a high traffic at one time type of a use. Generally, um, what Bluebird's found is for a facility of this size and any of their other locations that they have, this number of parking spaces is more than adequate. Um, and uh, to put more would just be adding impervious surface to the site for the sake of adding impervious surface at that point. They generally uh, don't see that all these spaces would be full at once and many of their other locations that are of the same size or even slightly larger. Um, so we're pretty satisfied that what's being proposed will be more than adequate for this project. Um, so yes, there is that. And then the, there is a, like a number of the other applicants this evening, there's this area on this project where there is not the uh, required landscape buffer. That is along the east side of the building where the unloading areas are. And that, in effect, is why it's paved to the building. The idea is if you were backing in a pick pickup truck or something, um, you would stop at the wheel stops be able to still unload onto a, a paved sidewalk area adjacent to the building. The doors, so there's uh, sliding doors under the canopy awnings that you can uh, basically roll a cart in and take your goods into your storage locker through there. We would ask that the board consider to uh, allow us to maintain that in this way, but uh, the applicant is open to working with you folks as well. Um, There was another uh, comment regarding making sure that there is no snow storage that takes place in the underdrain soil filters. And as uh, Ms. Saunders discussed with the previous applicant, you know, there's a good reason for that because you don't want to set them up, you know, your stormwater feature that you just built. So we are proposing along um, the driveway in from the sidewalk all the way down past the uh, box truck uh, parking areas. Uh, split rail fence to so they don't push snow into that area um, and again on this side the south end adjacent to that other under drain soil filter we were proposing again some split rail fence uh, to dissuade folks from pushing snow into the under drain soil filters um, there was a question about uh, temporary sidewalks during construction. Um, obviously, if we're going to be that close to the existing bituminous sidewalk, it's probably going to get damaged while they're putting the foundations in and things. So either we will you know, reroute them right adjacent to that in an area that's safe um, during construction or work with the, the town to find a location closer to the street, uh, possibly on the shoulder temporarily while the foundation's going in before they can move it back up the hill. Um, but we'll discuss that with staff and come to a, a conclusion. Uh, so just to give you a handle on the grade, it's pretty darn steep and there's that uh, drainage swale here that is an existing in that easement that currently is taking stormwater from the bulk of the 
east side of Enterprise Drive as it comes down through the area in the watershed and directing it to the large detention basin on the other side of Enterprise Drive. Um, so that grading is really hard to overcome right there. It's kind of an unmovable feature of the site, so to speak. Um, regarding the uh, fire truck access on the side of the building, the south end, right here, we will look at sliding that in as staff has discussed and pulling that underground soil filter over to allow for a better vegetated buffer up on Route 1. Um, you know, frankly, if, if the fire department has decided that that isn't necessary, then you know, we can accommodate and, and work with the town to make that a better buffer. Um, so though otherwise, that brings us to stormwater management. Uh, it did review Woodward and Curran's comments. I have to give them a call. We received the comments um, towards the end of the week last week, and I haven't had a chance to catch up with them. I just want to go through some of those comments with them. I think some of them may be holdovers from a previous review letter. And I'm not sure that some of them, uh, that, you know, we have a, we can come to terms with some of them because some of them don't relate to this project. Um, some of them do, and they're easy enough to answer. A lot of them are just uh, technique questions and comments. So if we have a conversation, I'm sure we can work it out. None of it was anything that was uh, impossible to tackle. Um, and again, lighting, you got, uh, there was a request for cut sheets, so we will provide those prior to the next meeting. Um, and again, I, I will let uh, Brendan dis discuss uh, the architecture and uh, signage. We did also bring with us in the handouts this evening um, a copy of the sign we would end up using. This sign is actually from the Hooksit facility. So you have a 16-foot height limitation. So the brick base will be cut down. This sign in Hooksit was on a slope. Obviously, we'll have that. Uh, the part that says VIF varies in, in field uh, or verified in field, that'll be shorter and the whole sign will maintain its uh, adherence to your sign requirements. Um, yeah, so otherwise, I think that about sums it up on our end and uh, we'll be addressing all the staff comments and peer review comments and getting that, those uh, responses back to staff. So I'll let Brendan talk a little bit about the building and uh, go from there. So I don't know what you want to use for a presentation, but the plan, the elevation views are at the end. All the way at the end. <coughs> Uh, Brendan McNamara. I'm a residential, residential designer uh, from Elliott, Maine. Um, and uh, even though the, uh, the drawings here are done by JSN engineers in Portsmouth, who I work with regularly, um, I worked originally with Bluebird to come up with a generalised um, thematic concept of the building. So it could be buildings that could be replicated across New England that uh, in some manner reflected New England architecture so they could be have a chance of being approved through towns like Scarborough and Manchester and Londonderry and towns of that nature. And uh, so, and what that is what we have here, although uh, remembering that it is uh, at its heart, it's a, a big three story climate controlled warehouse. It's, you know, what the building wants to be is a rectangular box that has no windows in it at all. And uh, um, the windows that are added are there for principally uh, where there's the office and then to break up the mass of the building. But that's the, the battle of form and function that we uh, have with this particular building. Um, so I know that you had some questions about the possibility of increasing the number of what are essentially, we call them faux windows, but they are, it's a real window set into a blank space. So it's not, it's just that there's 
a wall immediately behind the window. They appear as a normal window, and they are, but they're a window to nowhere. Um, and also, did, we did bring in just some examples of, so we are using the, the more and brick um, on the, the base and the water table area on the, on the end towers. But then the rest of the building is essentially the ephus, which I'm hoping that you're familiar with what that actually is. But there's an example of that down here too. Um, there's also the example down there of the glazed uh, blue brick, which is just a, a aesthetic element that goes around with the water table. Um, but the uh, so the building is fully insulated. It's meant to be a, a very uh, efficient building, and part of that exterior skin. Is, is part of that whole assembly. Do you have any questions? No, thank you very much. I do, well, I do have also, um, in the discussion of you know, changing some of the recesses to windows, if we were to do something of that nature, then we'd be looking for some sort of rhythmic um, appeal going along the building. So I did do some quick examples of how that may adjust going from what you have here as an example, sort of step by step, sort of going, well, if we, we could. Um, if we go to uh, more windows, then we, at the moment you've got the choices of the breaks between recesses, pairs of windows, or uh, actually quads or pairs. And then what I've shown here is if we go to more windows, then we probably just go to just vertical pairs going along, so we rem remain in some sort of regular rhythm. You have a drawing of this? Yeah. Uh, just for the sake of our board discussion. Right. So the way I put it together was so that you could do the comparison is that so the page one is as it's been put in the application and page two is sort of a stage one approach and page three is a stage So that was really just as a matter of uh, getting the discussion going. Is there anyone else from your team that is wishing to present? So with that, I'll, um, I'll have a public comment on this, uh, this item. So if there's anyone here from the public that would like to comment on this, please approach the podium, name and address. Seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, Roger, would you like to have first swing at this? It's my turn again. It is. It's a short board tonight. <laughs> I can't uh, run out of people to pick on. The, um, <laughs> sure. OK. Um, I'm just kind of curious. The rendering, that, you know, these renderings here, is that number one? On, on here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So there will actually be some windows. Are yeah. they, are they, are they going to be all fault windows? The, uh, on the, on the office? Yeah. yeah. At the office tower, mm. which is here, it is a genuine office. Um, so they are real windows. Um, as we move away from that, they move into for windows, which I hesitate to say because they are real windows, but they just, yeah. you know, it's like building a wall behind this window <coughs> here. So we continue the, the uh, monocoque insulation skin behind the window, but um, it's, it, it is glass and it's aluminum. But it's um, a window to nowhere. I, I, I like that. I like number one. I think it looks really nice. Um, um, I'm not sure if I have any. Oh, the only other thing, I guess, is the landscaping along Route 1. Did you touch upon that at all? Uh, briefly. Um, we did do a landscaping plan, and we had already proposed uh, some landscaping along Route 1. The circles with the diagonal lines towards the site, those are existing uh, decorative trees along Route 1 right now today. Mm -hmm. We're proposing some... Uh, infill trees and then some shrubs and whatnot along the uh, along that uh, area there behind those <coughs> existing trees 
the sign would be in this location and this plan we hadn't located it yet um, so if we were to remove or truncate the uh, turning and just get rid of this fire truck access here that we had put in along the side um, that under drain soil filter and everything could slide over uh, a fair amount of distance allow for uh, some well some of the buffer hang on a second Oop. up here would uh, retain its existing vegetation some more there's a good uh, stand of trees right in that corner um, so obviously they wouldn't have to cut that down if we're not cutting into the embankment right there. Um, but down further towards uh, the tire warehouse, we would be able to do a little bit more uh, buffering. Okay, I, uh, I don't have any other questions. I mean, I, I think it looks really nice. Thank you, Roger. I'm sold. <laughs> Rachel. Yeah, uh, what is the distance between um, your parking area in the back and the boundary line of the butter. To that back corner there? Yeah. All right. Um, well, let's go. Bear with me. I gotta, the landscaping is way at the end of the details. So i got to go back up. There is a setback uh, called out down that side. It's it's. 15 feet in most locations except for right at that corner where you go around the corner. I would say it's probably 10 at the closest. Um, and right now today the tire warehouse I would say is probably five feet down near the road a little bit. It looks like their dumpster is actually over the property line. So just for reference, but yeah, right in that corner looks like you're about 10. To the pavement edge, but the parking is uh, yeah. up against the building. It's really more of a driveway. There. So, let me so there's not going to be any snow storage. No, there's the edge. no. That's not the idea. And actually, on this site plan, we we include a note regarding snow storage. We understand that. Um, we have limited snow storage locations shown. So we have added note number 10 that snow from driveways and parking areas shall be removed from the premises as necessary due to the limited uh, room for snow storage. So obviously they would use the snow storage locations that we have designated first, you know, at the end of this area here, down here, and over, in, over here now they don't need to use. so. Maybe one of the things we, we do as we slide this stuff around is we make a little bit of an expanded area down on this corner and just make sure that it has some redirection from the um, under drain soil filter so it's not just getting pushed in there. And again, we'll maintain that split rail fence too. But actually along that back edge, um, it's interesting right now, the stormwater from Everything to the east kind of rolls across this property and, a, and actually bleeds over the sidewalk in a couple of spots. And um, if you look on the right hand of the image that I have on the screen, I have some darker green areas. Those are wet areas. And um, I am assuming that when either the daycare was constructed or one of the last times some work was done on that power line, they uh, p filled in a access way through here and put some cu cross culverts in. This, the wetland in this area um, to the east of the power lines actually didn't exist when Enterprise Drive was proposed initially. So that's something that's developed over time due to the culvert through that um, access way not being removed. So it's kind of dammed up some water. Um, when we do the work, we will actually remove those culverts and reestablish a, a hydraulic connectivity between the two areas of the, the smaller watershed to allow for water to get down and around and into the drainage network that goes under Enterprise Drive. But it, there's, 
we're actually proposing a swale along that back edge to redirect off-site flow down into those wet areas where they generally end up by meandering across the site. All right, thank you. I, I don't have any more questions. Probably. How many test pits did you do? Uh, there are a number. There's one right in the middle of the underdrain soil filter. There's one kind of close to this four bay, and there's one that actually lands right so, in the edge of the building close to where that underdrain soil filter is. And they have... Um, None of them hit refusal per se. Actually, I take that back. The one on this side hit it down at like eight feet, a little over eight feet. Um, I'm more I'm more concerned about the topsoil and supporting an underdrained soil filter here. We're gonna line them. They're gonna be lined, so they're all uh, manufactured soil media mm -hmm. inside of a poly liner. So how many um, how many square feet of wetland disturbance do you have here? Off the top of my head, I don't recall. Uh, I know that the one in the middle is around, there is one where the building is that's about mm -hmm. 10 to 11,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. It's quite a bit. And it tacks on to the other permits that came with Enterprise Drive. So did you consider then, when you did your, pre your, your pre-construction um, flows, my brain's shutting down, it's late. Your pre and post, did yep. you consider wetland Yes. Controls as um, helping attenuate some of the flow right now. And it sounds like you also have run on from another site. Oh, which, we have a run on from a yeah. lot of site. Yeah. And it's actually so, not even all from the Enterprise Drive um, subdivision. It's from kind of points northeast yeah. as well. And um, we did use the previous uh, designs post development drainage analysis mm -hmm. as our starting point um, so any improvements that they made over the pre-existing in theirs we didn't want to uh, impact um, yeah most I importantly we <coughs> wanted to make sure that our flows leaving this site were less than what was originally yeah I think I think you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have a tremendous challenge here with respect to stormwater um, and I definitely am I'm glad to hear that you're gonna reach out to Woodard and Curran to talk with them about what they've said um, because I'm seeing that. Have you built one of these in Maine yet? This is the first. It's apparent. Um, unfortunately, in some of the design specifications and things. So please reach out to town staff as well and talk about what we can do to nuance this to meet the main stormwater rigs. Um, and I apologize for being so blunt. It's just very late at night. Um, know what watershed you're in as well. Um, we're you're going to be in the um, Scarborough Marsh um, uh, immediate area, and um, you're you're just going to have a lot of stormwater issues here yeah, and run on and run off. There's, it's a clay site, so we're fully aware. So when you say that um, you're going to remove snow store, you're going to remove snow from the site. Where's it going to go? wherever it's allowed to go. Okay. I'll stop there. Thank you, Robert. Um, so as, you know, I, what I like to do before you leave here is make sure you feel like you have a good grasp of what it is that is being expected of you, that we're still requesting, uh, things of that nature. Is there anything in particular that you feel like you as an applicant need some more clarity on from planning board uh, going forward? Um, obviously, we're going to address like staff and peer review comments with staff and the peer review agencies, uh, Woodward and Curran and Mr. Bray. Um, I guess really it would be more relegated to things that deal with uh, site amenities that aren't technical um, in nature. Things like the, how do you folks feel about the lack of a five foot landscape buffer across the back of the building where basically it's a sidewalk against the building to get to those sliding doors under the uh, canopy areas. And I think you had provided a response earlier and it had to do with people yeah, unloading trying. and just kind of this usefulness of 
yeah. having all sidewalk there, right? Yeah. So we're just, I don't think that came up in any of our board comments. I think we were satisfied generally with your response to staff's comments. <coughs> right? So um, I didn't hear anyone begging for more landscaping in that area, and I'll assume that that's not going to be the requirement. So, um, yeah, you know, one thing I, I know you gave a kind of a response to this um, right when you started out, but uh, the overhead power line. Yes. So you're saying it goes to another end user? Is that? It appears to. It terminates, it goes from down here along the poles to a pole here, and then it turns, goes this way, and continues up the street. So in order for you to drop it underground, do you need special permissions? Is it not really your responsibility to drop it underground? Is that your argument or um, what's your outlook on it? You kind of have to go out there and walk up Enterprise Drive and figure out where it ends. Okay. Do it tonight if it wasn't dark. But, um, <laughs> uh, Okay. Yeah, so that's something that we'll consult will, with CMP. Okay. Um, and then, as far as staff is concerned, is there anything that maybe we didn't get answered fully satisfactorily, or you would like some more guidance on in any of these areas? Yeah, I think as as was noted, a lot of the issues are sort of technical in nature, but certainly um, I think it's a little more guidance in terms of the building architecture and sort of those EFIS areas. Um, typically the design standards really look for any architectural features to sort of have a, to be an architectural feature more than just sort of a, um, but um, so really look to the board if you're comfortable with what was proposed or if, um, continue a conversation about how to maybe accentuate or articulate those as either windows or maybe it's some other type of treatment. Um, so I guess that, that would be something that would be helpful to have a little guidance on I'm sure. I think I, I heard Roger comment that he was okay with the building architecture. I don't know if... Well, I, I'm, I'm looking at the colors there and I'm trying to figure out uh, what color mm -hmm. goes with what feature. The, um, this isn't, the EFIS is a, unfortunately this is a stock standard uh, EFIS sample. It doesn't reflect the big variety that's being used. So the actual color is, um, on the ethos, there's two forms of gray. It's a mid gray and a dark gray to accentuate. So all the, the window recess features are actually a different color. So it's a, the general building is a mid gray, and then where, where there's a recess, it's a dark gray. Well, is there trim around the wind, uh, frames around the windows, looks like? In the actual windows, they're possessed of their own uh, frame, but they're set directly into either the brick or... <coughs> and and the, those colors would be? They are... Uh, I think it would be important to see the, the, the actual colors, samples of the actual yeah. colors. And you know, this, this building looks fine, but it also looks pink. So I'd like to, I'd like right. to see what the whole color scheme is. No, that's fine, we can bring actual samples of that. Robin, do you have any? I guess I, I just want to go back to the whole idea of the windows that are just, they're going to be there, but they're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to see in or out. Inside all these windows yeah. here, you know, is, is actual storage. Yeah. So it would be counter to the nature of the mm -hmm. preservation of stored items. Sure. No, I get it. Sorry, I don't have any burning. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I think that, it, I mean, I think you indicated you're dealing with a, a big metal box that wants to be a big metal box that you're trying to make it look a little prettier. Mm -hmm. So I think um, given that, given that, it's okay. And uh, I've seen worse. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is a ringing endorsement. <laughs> not to, not trying to. Yeah. Actually, uh, can we scroll through the renderings? 
the renderings, the one thing that I suppose. The renderings renderings are there. It, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't think yeah. it's the. Uh, well, it's, more, it's more the fact that there, there is actually, the rendering is reflected better, is, is that um, the features aren't flat features. You know, so the brick, the brick pilasters are uh, brick pilasters that are dimensioned to a full size brick going up. So everything is within the expected dimension. The, the, um, the soffit overhang of the main towers is five feet high and it's hanging out. I think it's four foot six. I mean, they are. They're big. I mean, it's it's um, they're they're not sort of mean little aspects. And then like the the edge of the parapet at the top of the ephus. I mean, that overhang is large enough to allow the the piles of brickwork to come up and to be landing. So it's it's um, it's not like a Walmart building. I mean, even though yeah. I mean, on one hand, it is a Walmart building. I think it's a big square box yeah. you know, of which we've applied a, a generous amount of detail. But no detail is mean in the essence of it. You know, it's generous in volume and size. So. so Nick, I guess I would say that, you know, if it's a box that wants to be a box, you've done a really good job of breaking it up and adding interest and, and yeah. that kind of a thing. I mean, it could be just a warehouse, you know, like yeah. a, a metal yeah. warehouse and you have done a, I think, a, a, a very good job of. Thank you. Of and there's plenty of them that, that are. <laughs> and well, course, thank you for not bringing that. I know, but the thing is, of course, as soon as you see self storage, you go, "Oh yeah. my God, it's going to be, yeah. you know, it's going to be blue, or Absolutely. it's going to be orange." And so, yeah. no, this is good. Thank you. So, I think uh, for the architectural, I think yep. the board's generally satisfied with what's being presented here. Um, is there any other outstanding items that you guys might think you want some direction on? Um, that said, uh, thank you. It was a uh, good presentation. I'm glad we got you in this evening. It was, yeah. Even uh, even with you taking the, the delay of game, and uh, we still got you in. So. It was the right thing to do. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. those guys wanted to get going, and, and we were waiting for a member of our team. So I'm glad thank it worked you. out. Thank I you. want to say thanks uh, for your time. I know it's getting late, so. We will see you again. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, guys. Oh, so we are to staff comments. I have a few. Um, staff has started, uh, the Scarborough Downs Crossroad Holdings team has submitted a pre-application, or did submit a pre-application review to staff and to peer reviewers. So uh, staff and their peer reviewers provided for phase one of the Scarborough Downs, um, the southern portion there. And so staff did work with the team to provide uh, comments on their design, and they should be submitting to full site plan very soon. So. And we do have a mylar for the Mitchell Hill Estate subdivision uh, that needs to be signed by board members. So okay. We do that before we take off. And then I have uh, next is the administrative amendment report. Is there any report there? No. no administrative. Amendment. Correspondence. I know we um, received a letter um, regarding the public safety building, uh, which I believe every member here has received. So I uh, will note that. Any other correspondence that anyone has to report? Okay. Planning board comments? Um, well done, Mr. Chair, getting us through such an aggressive mm -hmm. agenda, and staff as well. Thank you all. Staff, especially, uh, you guys have been working really hard lately, we've noticed. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> good job. Um, and Karen, again, thank you for being here this evening to help um, contribute to the efforts of Scarborough. So, uh, I've got adjournment next. Does anyone want uh, to make that motion one? to adjourn? Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it.